Uh, good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee uh, in 2013. Can I remind all those present that all electronic devices should be switched off at all times when you're in the committee. Uh, our first agenda item today is to decide whether to consider our draft reports on the Children and Young People Scotland Bill and the draft budget in private at future meetings. Are members agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, our next item is to continue our evidence taking on the Children and Young People Scotland Bill. Can I welcome to the meeting this morning Aileen Campbell, Minister for Children and Young People, uh, and our supporting officials from the Scottish Government, uh, Phil Rains, Head of Child Protection, David Blair, Head of Looked After Children, and Gordon McNichol, who is a solicitor with the, solicitor with the Communities and Education uh, Division. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, can I place on record the committee's thanks to the Minister and officials for responding in what was a, a short timescale uh, to the range of questions from the committee from last week. Um, and I'm sure that your helpful response will be covered uh, in some of the questioning today. So thank you very much for that. Uh, before I move to questions, can I invite the Minister to make a short uh, opening statement? Yes, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Committee. Uh, and thank you for inviting me today to give evidence on the Children and Young People Bill. Now, for the last eight weeks, the Committee has been hearing evidence on a wide range of issues in what is quite a complex bill. And we'll be talking about those issues today. And I want to set the tone uh, with a few remarks about what binds these issues together. With this bill, we have set out our ambition to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. And I think it's an ambition that we all share. The bill advances this by drawing on well-established policies and strategies. It takes forward our long-standing recognition that we need to make a bigger impact in the early years of our children, not least through early learning and childcare. It lifts to a new level Scotland's unique, internationally lauded approach to helping children and young people through getting it right for every child. And over the years, this Parliament has regularly endorsed the approach. Gerfec has already taken seeds in parts of Scotland, and we believe the time is right for its fruits to be enjoyed by all our families. The Bill advances our national determination to improve the lives of our most vulnerable children and young people. Our proposals for looked after children are rooted in what is needed by children who are in care, by children at risk of going into care, and by young people who have moved on from care. The bill gives our natural and deeply embedded respect for the rights of children's statutory grounding in a way that fits Scotland's traditions and looks to our future aspirations. The bill builds on the best practice and experience of what we have achieved already in Scotland. Our proposals and their costs are drawn from extensive experience across the country. But the bill is not simply a series of small steps forwards. It's a huge leap not into the known, but towards what the evidence tells us is the right thing to do for children. And that's particularly true of its commitments to early intervention. We know that a light touch applied when concerns first arise can often avoid a descent into difficulties which necessitate heavy formal measures. This preventative approach usually leads to far better outcomes for both the child and for their family. And that's why we want to set in statute the crucial principles of proportionate, preventative and child-focused support for all children. The other principles this Parliament espouses, we have set out what we think will best achieve those principles. And as we have throughout the huge consultation on this bill, we continue to listen and stand ready to improve the bill where necessary. So thank you, Convener, for inviting me here today. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. And I'm sure they have many. Um, well, you'll be, uns you'll be unsurprised to know that we yep. do have many, uh, Minister, <laughs> on, on, <coughs> on this bill. It's a very important bill and there are a lot of Im important issues that we want to cover. Before I get into the detail of, uh, of the bill itself, and then there's, there's some wider points that uh, uh, members want to hear your response on, and I want <coughs> to ask Liz Smith to ask those questions. Uh, good morning, Minister, and uh, thank morning. you for your opening remarks. It, it is a complex bill, and as the convener said, it's, it's a big bill too, so we've got to get this right. Um, it's been put to us as a committee in some of the written evidence that there are certain points of law uh, where there is a difference of opinion between what the Scottish Government's advice has been and what uh, groups are saying. For example, there's been a difference of opinion uh, between the Children's Commissioner and the Scottish Government about uh, the legal advice behind whether we should incorporate or not uh, UNCRC into uh, Scots law. There's been a difference of opinion between the Faculty of Advocates and the Scottish Government over part four uh, of the bill. And there's also been some uh, questions over legislative competency uh, from the Information Commissioner. Um, could you uh, tell us whether you think the Scottish Government is confident that the legal advice which you've been given on these points of law is accurate? 
Well, thank you for the question. And but clearly, I can't go into the detail of the advice that we get. But we know that every bit of legislation that we put forward as a government is uh, is competent, uh, and uh, that's something that's no less true for for this bill. Um, I can't comment on the the legal advice that you've been given, and I'm sure that that will come out in any stage one report that you publish. But certainly, um, from my point of view, this bill is competent, um, and and that's true of any bit of legislation that the government puts forward. Could, could I just home in on the fact about that there's a difference of interpretation of some points of law? Uh, for example, um, in part four, the Faculty of Advocates is arguing very clearly that when it came, comes to the named person section, uh, that there uh, is an attempt to dilute the legal role of parents. Now, that's clearly not <coughs> the government's view. Um, uh, they go on to say that... Um, it, it, under, it potentially undermines the family autonomy and provides a potential platform for interference with private and family life in a way which could violate Article 8 of ECHR. Now, the government believes differently. Could you just explain how you've come to that different conclusion? Well, I think often in terms of the way in which services intervene into a child's life, there's often a pendulum that swings between parents and children's rights. But certainly from our point of view, this, the name person um, provision within the bill is about providing a support network and a framework to support families uh, if they need that. And that's them, their right to then choose if they seek uh, advice from that named person. At more um, complex stages of need, um, the named person will be there to see if there is a cause for concern and at that point seek the appropriate supports to ensure that that child gets the help that they, they need. But in terms, again, you know, of um, the, the point of law that you, you point to, this is a competent bill. It's 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 a legally competent bill, as is every bit of legislation that this government puts yeah, puts sorry, forward. I, I don't think the Faculty of Advocates are arguing about the legislative competence of that bit. They're making the point that in that section they believe that there is a dilution of the role of parents. No, is so that there's no dilution in the role of parents because this the name person provision is very different from the role of a parent. We know that the parent is the most important person in the child's life, the most important educator in a child's life as well. The name person is a framework to provide additional support if that family decides that they need it or to identify issues that may be a cause for concern and at which point they can then seek to support that child to ensure that that child has better outcomes okay. in life. So there's no dilution in the role of parent and the 1995 Act, which states a lot of um, clear, very clearly about the role of parents, that, you know, that's no longer so, diluted either. So the Scottish Government has no concerns about the, con the issue that's been raised by the Faculty of Advocates? Well, I think, you know, as is the case for any bit of legislation that goes through the three processes, the three stages in uh, Parliament, we'll listen clearly and closely to what people have to say. But in our terms of what, what we know about the competence of this bill is that it is a competent bill and the name person provision in no way dilutes the role of the parent. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Minister, obviously one of the issues that's uh, central to the bill is uh, this question about uh, UNCRC duties. Um, and obviously some uh, witnesses have supported the idea of, of full incorporation of UNCRC into Scots law. Uh, other witnesses have taken a very different point of view and have said that they think that would not uh, be particularly helpful or particularly sensible. Can I ask... What is the government's view, in terms of what's currently in the bill, um, of the duties that you are um, placing on ministers, and, and what practical impact, what practical difference will these ministerial duties make to children? Mm -hmm. um, yes, and I was interested to see uh, Kenneth Norrie's submission, both in writing and his uh, remarks that he gave to the uh, to the committee. Now, the duty that we'll be putting in this bill is a duty on ministers. Uh, to provide for, um, to reflect the UNCRC. So that will child rights proof all our decisions um, and will be a tool, will be developed to support that and will take practical actions to increase awareness of children's rights, whether that be through schools with professionals or parents. But certainly in terms of the practical impact, it's a new duty on ministers to properly reflect the UNCRC in the policies that we take forward as, as a government. That's very helpful, but what, what difference is there in the bill that you couldn't do at the moment, or you don't do at the moment? What difference does it make um, in terms of ensuring that ministers do carry out these duties? I mean, what, what duties are you not carrying out at the moment that the bill would actually force you to carry out? 
Well, we'll make, we'll make sure it'll be a, an, a duty to make sure that the UNCRC is properly reflected in the policies that we take forward, and we'll have to, um, you know, we'll have to put that forward to Parliament, make sure that Parliament understands that that's that's what we we are doing, uh, and so there will be a scrutiny there to enable Parliament to, to see that that has been the the case. Um, like I say, it will child's right proof all our decisions, not just of this government, but future governments as well. So it's not just about making sure that this government does all it can to reflect the UNCRC, but it's about making sure that in the future that that is the case for all governments and subsequent governments that are elected to this uh, parliament. Um, we've also wanting to ensure that we raise awareness of um, uh, ch children's rights across not just the work that we do in government, but right across um, the public sector uh, as well, because there needs to be an understanding of the UNCRC before you can reflect the uh, the good practice and the culture within the, the decisions that you that you take. Okay. Can I move on just a little bit um, on to the, the nub of some of the argument here? The, um, there, clearly, as I said earlier, there's a difference of opinion about implementation of the, or sorry, incorporation of uh, UNCRC versus incorporating the principles of UNCRC. Um, the Charter itself versus some of the principles which underlie the Charter. Uh, why have the government come down on, uh, on the side of effectively moving forward with some of the principles which underline UNCRC without uh, going the full way and in incorporating the whole Charter? Mm -hmm. Well, again, you know, the whole premise of this bill is to make sure that we make a difference, a real practical difference to children's lives. And the, the approach we've taken is to ensure that rights are made real for children, that, that there is a, a real uh, and tangible um, recognition that the child's rights are important in the policy decisions that we take. So, you know, that's been the premise and we believe that the, the, the balance that we've struck within this bill does achieve that without it getting caught up uh, in a, a legal wrangling. So this is about making rights uh, real and um, the approach that's better that we've outlined in this bill with uh, Scots Law and I you know, refer again to what Professor Kenneth Norrie told you as well about, you know, that he, he said, I think, to incorporate the Convention into the domestic legal system of Scotland would be bad policy, bad practice and bad law. So we're wanting to make sure that this is a good move and that it does make rights real for children across Scotland. And we believe that the balance we've got in this bill is uh, properly and, uh, struck. Oh, OK, thank you. I've got one final specific question for myself before I open up to other members. Um, obviously, um, and you'll have seen some of the evidence when, mem when witnesses have talked about the situation in Wales, where ministers are under a duty to pay due regard to mm -hmm. the UNCRC. Why did the Scottish Government change the duty from due regard to keep under consideration? Well, we've, there's never been previously a, a duty to have due regard uh, to an international treaty. And we, um, our policy, like I said at the start, our policy has not changed. And we've been committed to introducing legislation which requires a systematic consideration of children's rights. And that's what our initial proposals provided for, and that's what this bill uh, delivers on. But, Minister, wasn't the, the phrase due regard in the consultation the government issued? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, what we're wanting to make sure is that the children's rights are real. So this approach that we've um, outlined within the bill um, is the one that we think strikes that balance. And, of course, there was no real... Um, consensus as well about the approach within the consultation process. So what we've got now is a bill that makes children's rights real and does so in a, in a way that doesn't get caught up in legal wranglings and without the uncertainty of knowing how courts would interpret that due regard duty. Uh, can, can I just, sorry, I just want to just pursue this a little, little bit further. I'm trying to understand what the difference is between due regard and keep under consideration. Clearly, there have been witnesses who have submitted evidence to this committee which says that effectively due regard is a stronger position than uh, keep under consideration. Mm -hmm. um, do you accept that? And if you, or if you don't accept that, and I presume you don't, um, could you explain why? I mean, for some of these more, more legal approaches, I might bring in uh, Gordon. Would you like to comment on some of these issues? I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think there's an interesting question as to what a, a requirement of due regard to, the, to, 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 to anything is. How, how, how much regard do you have to have to it? And what we've government sought to do in the bill is set out exactly what they are wanting um, themselves, ministers and other public authorities to do. Um, there could be an argument that due regard, a requirement of due regard to uh, an international le legal obligation is, is you must comply with it. Well, is that actually what we want to do or is it not? And I think the government's view is that it's important not to get hung up with particular words. 
but to set out exactly in the bill what is the scope of the duty we want to uh, create for ministers and for other public authorities. Okay, thank you. Um, Neil Levy. Thanks, Camino. Um Children's organisations have um, also expressed concern that this bill does not do enough to ensure that public bodies will help to uh, strengthen children's rights. Can I ask you, Minister, what action um, is the Scottish Government prepared to take to strengthen the duty on public bodies in the bill in relation to children's rights? Well, we've got a, a commitment to raise awareness um, across the public bodies as well, and there'll be um, reporting uh, as well to make sure that we understand where they are on children's rights to, uh, as well. Okay. Um, in terms of, um, there's been a number of questions raised about child rights impact assessments, and um, I, I want to ask you, um, what, what commitment will the Scottish Government now give that future legislation impacting upon children, young people and their families will be subject to a child's right impact assessment? Um, sorry, by... There was concern raised that uh -huh. a child's rights impact assessment about, wasn't so, so carried out. Subsequent bits what, of legislation? Yeah, will they be okay. subject to... Will, will the government consider... We're developing a, a tool for a child's rights impact assessment and so that should uh, enable us to understand how children's rights are being impacted upon by subsequent legislation. OK. Um, Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much, Minister. I wanted to ask you a few questions about the information sharing aspects of the bill. Um, my, my understanding is that we are moving uh, from uh, the kind of information that can be shared without consent. And I wondered whether you could explain how the bill changes the type of information that is shared and why it's necessary. Um, good practice would be that you'd always seek the consent of the, the parent and where appropriate the, the child as well. But um, recent advice from the Information Commissioner clarified that sharing information about a concern of a risk of a child's well-being that may lead to harm without consent doesn't breach the DPA, provided that that sharing is proportionate and considered. So that's the kind of key phrase there, is making sure that that professional judgment is proportionate and, and considered. So where there is a risk of harm, um, the Commissioner has given that clarity um, already that information can be shared, but good practice is always that you would seek uh, consent from the parent and, where appropriate, uh, the child as well. Right. But my understanding is there's a difference between r risk of harm and well-being. Uh, well, yes, again, you know, the, whole per the whole premise of the Bill is those about early intervention, and we need to make sure, though, that... Um, where there is a concern about a child's well-being, that the information is proportionately uh, shared in a, at, at an appropriate time. So those are the, the, the trigger points by which then that would enable that, that professional to make a judgment about the appropriateness of sharing that mm -hmm. information. Right. Is there not a danger um, that perhaps uh, you know some of the inf individual information holders, perhaps teachers or health visitors, would have to decide on their own whether sharing information about well-being would would breach um, ECHR Article Eight? I mean, there's a lot of room for to make sure that there's clarity within the guidance that we'll produce to accompany this bill to to enable and empower professionals to make the appropriate judgment on the information that they share. But certainly, um, aside from the bill, the Information Commissioner's letter was useful clarity to empower professionals to make the correct judgment. But we have to make sure that, um, that that's strengthened and robust within the guidance that accompanies this bill to give um, Duke to recognise the, the issues that have been raised with the committee about any concerns that are there. And we'll certainly make sure that we work with stakeholders to um, uh, develop that. And Bill Alexander's information as well, uh, evidence that I think he gave to you showed that you know maybe before the GERFEC approach there was a scattergun approach to maybe sharing some of that information but this approach within the bill allows for that to be done in a much uh, better way, a much more systematic and coherent way to enable uh, appropriate services to be uh, provided to that child to enable their long-term well-being. Right. Wh when will we see the guidance? The guidance will be developed um, alongside the bill but um, Phil can you perhaps uh, elaborate on that issue. Quite a lot of work has been going in from um, the responsible teams within the Scottish Government to developing the guidance in consultation with uh, quite a wide range of stakeholders. And a lot of that's being done through, you're probably aware of the GERFEC um, program board, 
and they are, I guess, have general oversight for the development of the guidance. My understanding is that the guidance is now reached a draft stage, and I think consultation will begin um, shortly over the coming months. So the, certainly the intention is to make sure that the guidance um, and all the range of duties with respect to GERFEC are um, uh, well in place before commencement of any provisions. Right, okay. Um, one specific point uh, that was that was raised um, by LGBT Scotland was a concern that uh, young people's privacy could be compromised by information sharing, perhaps teachers sharing information with the best of intentions about a young person's sexuality would, would then breach the privacy of that young person. I wondered if you could give any reassurances to LGBT Youth Scotland that uh, the privacy of young people will be protected? Well, we certainly have a uh done worked you know the whole premise of the bill is to work with the whole ch child and ensure that they, they are uh, the best practice is adhered to and that would be about con consulting with the child and and speaking with the child as well um, so absolutely able to um, give that uh, confirmation and also to work with these groups as we develop guidance um, through the course of the bill's progression okay. thank you very much Bill MacArthur Thank you, Convener, and apologies uh, for my delayed arrival um, due to flight problems. Um, just following up this, I, I, the, the concerns that, that Joe McAlpine raised, uh, Minister, you, you, you've, you prayed an aid, Professor Norrie, earlier on in relation to incorporation of UNCRC. Uh, Professor Norrie's uh, evidence to the committee was perhaps uh, equally lurid in relation to section 26-27. Uh, I think he encouraged us to, to, to perhaps um, move to remove um, uh, section 27 entire, uh, entirely, uh, and that would be uh, serving uh, the, the public uh, perhaps very well indeed. I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but I, I think we've had now evidence from a range of, of different witnesses who have indicated concerns about the uh, the, the breadth of the provisions in, in 27 uh, and how far they go in terms of information sharing and, and uh, the absence of consent for that uh, information sharing in, in, in areas where we're talking about well-being as opposed to welfare. Is this, uh, is this something that you are prepared well, to, to look at again? At, at absolutely happy to, to listen to um, the evidence that you've, you've got as a committee and the evidence that's been presented to you in the committee sessions as we, as we go through the bill, absolutely happy to listen to people you know, like Ken Norrie who has a huge wealth of knowledge on the issues that we're, we're looking at. Do, do you accept Ken Norrie's um, assessment that, that at the moment section 27 is potentially too open-ended and where people perhaps but exercising professional judgment may come to the right decisions at, at the moment the way that this is uh, this is phrased um, uh, leaves but well, like I say, you know, we want to make this bill the best that it can be, so we would need to listen to the evidence that you've got, no doubt the Stage 1 committee report that you'll publish uh, to enable us to make sure that the bill is the best that it can be and, you know, people like Ken Norrie and others who have given of their time and their knowledge to enable you to, to prepare that report are well worth uh, listening to, so we'll make that commitment that we'll, we'll look at that um, in detail. Can I follow up? Uh, that line of questioning from Liam MacArthur. I mean, the uh, sorry, Ken McDonald, the Assistant Commissioner of Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, uh, stated uh, uh, in light of Professor Norrie's comments, which uh, we've just been discussing, uh, and I want to quote what he wrote to us in supplementary evidence. As written, talking about Section 27, as written, the section would override all statutory bars on the disclosure of information, many of which have been acted in order to give children protection. And it may also have implications for the independence of the judiciary where court orders prohibit disclosure. We would therefore urge that the content of this section is reconsidered. That's quite strong language there from the Assistant Commissioner, Scotland and Northern Ireland. I mean, what's the government's views on both Professor Norrie's uh, comments, which you've just referred to, and indeed Ken McDonald's supplementary evidence to the committee? Okay, can I bring in uh, Gordon? Can you reply to some of those things? <coughs> Excuse me. Certainly, um, I think it's important to remember, uh, as a starting point, for uh, address the question in more detail, that this provision, as in it, with any other provision, has to be read in accordance with um, ECHR. So there can be no question of this provision overriding ECHR. It can't override data protection because that would be out with competence. And as with any uh, legislation um, passed by the Scottish Parliament, you have to read it. 
any powers conferred as being constrained by issues such as ECHR, issues such as um, the um, re reserved legislation, such as, as the Data Protection Act. Certainly, in principle, yes, it, it does appear to be um, a, 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 a relatively a fairly wide power to disclose information, but it has to be read in that context, and that, I would suggest, it, it certainly is government's view that, um, read in that way, it is not as broad as, as might be suggested. Um, I accept what you're saying, but I'm therefore slightly surprised that um, the Assistant Commissioner wrote to us in the manner that he did, um, because he seems to say, it, have, well, it doesn't seem he says that, that he have, they have reconsidered the issue in light of Professor Norrie's comments, and I, I won't re read it out again, but obviously he takes a very different view from what you've just stated. Perhaps we could get some clarity around that from the government in writing, if that would be helpful to the committee, because clearly there is a difference, of, clearly a difference of opinion. Yeah, absolutely. We can we can get back on any anything in writing, but again, you know, I just make the point that we are listening to the evidence that you're getting and will ensure the need that we uh, use that evidence to make this bill the best that it can be. But it helps the committee, obviously, in writing our stage uh, one Oh, absolutely, reports, and I'll make that commitment. Clarity. And That's I'm just fine. making the point that you know, we're listening to what, what you're being told okay. and taking can these move, things very seriously. Can I move very briefly on to Section 26? Um, again, Professor Norrie, again, and, uh, said there were huge ambiguities in the drafting of the bill. Um, in its current form, it will lead to lots and lots of litigation. Um, and goes on to talk about it in not the most shining light. Uh, section, uh, section 26 says concerns and some others seem to ref to particularly relate to 26.1 where you must provide, 26.2a where it might be relevant and 26.2b where it ought to be provided. He, he had some difficulty, he said, with the clarity around these three phrases. What's the government's view of the evidence that uh, Professor Norrie submitted to the committee on this? Well, Again, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll listen to the points that he raises, but you know, the, the bill has been drafted to, to enable uh, the appropriate information sharing to, to happen, which is uh, proportionate and timely. Yeah, I'm, no, I accept that, Minister, and I, I, I don't want to labour this point, but um, both Professor Norrie and some other um, witnesses uh, and those who provided oral uh, sorry, written evidence were concerned that there was a lack of clarity for those who would have to share information mm -hmm. around the phrases must provide, might be relevant, ought to be provided. And I'm, I'm just looking for some clarity now about whether or not individuals, whether or not there's, there's room for improvement here, or the government's view is that this is currently correct as it's currently drafted, um, and whether or not individuals who will have to actually take this uh -huh. practical decision on the ground about what they should share uh -huh. and what they should not share will be clear about what these phrases yeah, and mean. I think it's also it's worthwhile remembering that there will be guidance which has been will be getting developed uh, in consultation with folk who know best and that will be the people who are working on the ground to make sure that you know alongside this bill guidance will be robust to empower the pr pr practitioners and professionals who are making these decisions so there's <laughs> always room to look at the bill and if there are real concerns we'll, we can again listen to the comments that you've received as a committee but alongside that, we'll have um, guidance that will, will enable practitioners and professionals to make uh, the best judgments in the interest of the child that they're dealing with. OK, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, I'd like to ask um, some, some further question around the area of the named person. Um, and it's already been covered, and you've been quite robust in, in, in stating that um, you don't see any tensions between the named person and the rights and responsibilities of parents as set out in the Children's Scotland Act 1995. But where disputes between parents and young people and the named person arise about what's best for a child or young person, what, what will be the method of resolving those conflicts? Um, well, like I say, you know, there's often a pendulum that swings between... Um, the parent and the, and, and the child and this is about making sure that the best interests of the child and the family are at the heart of the decisions that are, that are taken. Um, so we want to, to make sure that that, that is uh, absolute, absolutely right and um, I don't know, Films, would you like to uh, come in on, on that? Okay. I guess the three ways to think of it. First of all, the whole premise of the named person is basically built on the idea of a good trusted relationship that should be established between the individual who would clearly, I think from the evidence you've heard, should be someone that the family uh, are, are 
you know, know of and, and, and see on a regular, or see on a reasonably regular basis. So the first thing is the, the whole thing is predicated on the idea that you have good communications, good relationships. But clearly, that's not going to work in all circumstances. Um, there are already existing uh, mechanisms for raising grievances, for, for I guess, challenging issues about the about uh, about many of the roles of these these people provided. We've talked about the name person being teachers and health visitors, what have you. There are existing mechanisms for that. And at the moment, we're considering whether it makes sense to use those mechanisms or whether there's, there's a need for a, a, a more bespoke mechanism, what have you. Uh, and we're still very much listening about that. Um, um, we're very conscious that we don't want to further clutter a landscape um, with regard to the way that people can challenge decisions or challenge, shall we say, conduct that takes place within the, uh, the public service for that kind of role. Thank you. Um, during the consultation, um, there was a, a, a considerable amount of support. 72% of respondents were in favour of a named person um, role um, within the bill. Um, but in the bill, it also says that the named person would be responsible for support and advice to parents. Um, I just wonder how, how you envisage that that will happen. Um, what kind of support and advice would be available and what implications that has for the capacity and the role of the named person at any particular time? Mm -hmm. I think the, the support to parents and advice could take uh, a number of, of different forms, you know, from, from instance, from, um, for instance, you know, for the health visitor, it could be about toilet training, it could be as simple as signposting to an appropriate service within that local area. Um, in the school, that could be around uh, identifying if there's a need for assistance with, with homework or whatever, identifying that that child needs a bit of support in terms of, of homework. So it could be uh, as light touch uh, as that, but of course, you know, where there are uh, where there's greater need, there will be a, a, a real um, bonus in having the named person to coordinate services appropriately and at a timely um, moment to enable that child to get the best support that they can in a coordinated uh, way. So there is a number of different ways in which the named person can um, help that, that child uh, and direct and advise that, that family as appropriate and if that family des decides that they need to, to seek that advice and help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Neil Bibby. Thanks, Camilla. Um, there's been a, an issue, one of the issues raised with us um, about the anxiety uh, that's developed because of a confusion between the roles of uh, the lead professional, um, who's a traditionally a social worker and the named person. Uh, Minister, do you agree that the role of the named person must be clearly defined and differentiated from uh, that of the lead professional? Well, the named person will have a, a statutory footing within the bill, and of course, to again to you know um, give greater clarity, there will be a need to um, develop robust uh, guidance to to go along with this bill to give that clarity to to the professionals who are um, working with uh, children and families across the country. Can I just follow up on that, um, uh, Minister, if you don't mind? It just struck me as, as you were answering that question um, about the difference between um, a lead professional and a named person. Um, who ultimately is responsible when things go wrong? Is the named person, does the named, named person have some sort of legal responsibility here? No, no. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, it'll be the service pr provider and we need to make sure that the um, the named person is, is supported, but it's the the um, the authority by which they, they are they are coming from the department or you know the health board or, or the local authority. It's not the named person is not to be held legally account for things when things go wrong. But we are wanting to make sure that the the named person is given the empowered to make decisions at an early time to avoid uh, issues going wrong in the first place. Well, and that's the whole point of absolutely. preventative. A spending and early and effective intervention. Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm very supportive of that uh, that philosophy and that direction of travel in terms of policy. But I'm just trying to clarify for perhaps those who would be in that position um, what their level of responsibility is. If they, for whatever reason, fail to share um, vital information, what what level of responsibility does that named person have? We seem to be. We are adding um, a level of responsibility to the named person, whether it be a head teacher or a health visitor. Um, I think that's the purpose that they are at the core of this. Um, 
therefore, it does seem to logically follow that they must have some sort of responsibility for the actions they take or don't take. Yeah, and uh, you know, again, you know, that's that's still true regardless of 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 the the bill. You know, people have a, a duty of care for for the child that's um, that they're looking out for. So. Um, I think you've seen as well from the kind of tragic incidences that have happened across other parts of, of the UK where that information doesn't share, then there has to be a kind of you know, a stock take and, and figure out what, what you do and how you improve your systems. This named person is providing a framework by which the information can be shared in a much more coordinated and appropriate way uh, to enable the right services to intervene at the appropriate time to, to stop and avoid uh, horrible things happening to children that we see have seen uh, fairly fairly recently. Um, but, Phil, would you like to come in in terms of some of the more specific points that, that the uh, convener has raised around um, the um, responsibility line squarely with the, the named person? Mm -hmm. the, I might distinguish it in two ways. The bill makes clear the legal responsibility for the named person duties lies with what we call the named person service provider. So it's a uh, so in the case of, let's say, you know, kids in schools and teachers, what have you, would lie with the local authority, health visitors with the health service. So that's very clear. It's a corporate, if you will, responsibility. But I think, uh, I suspect, convener, what you're getting at is maybe more that sense of responsibility in terms of their day-to-day -day business and their conduct. And I think that has to be, that has to be thought in terms of the, um, the existing mechanisms that be in place for setting, I guess, standards of uh, professional conduct and also in terms of the uh, mechanisms I think it links back to the earlier point made about mechanisms for grievance or redress, if you what have you. Um, I guess one building on what the minister said, one of the ways to think about this is that there is already in, there is already um, in place that sense of responsibility, that sense in which many of these individuals are carrying out these 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 functions already, um, and they are managed within the existing. Um, architecture for how their how their uh, roles are defined and how they are held to account, if you will, the standards that are set for those roles. So we'll be building um, on the good practice on the existing architecture that's already out there. Uh, I think the bill Alexander said to you as well that uh, what teachers and midwives tell me is that it doesn't change what they do; it changes how they are regarded. They feel it has empowered them. So I think that's an important message as well. Okay, that, that's that's helpful. Thank you, Minister. Can I uh, move to Liz Smith? Minister, uh, last week uh, when the Finance Committee uh, produced its report, um, it uh, really began its report by saying that there were very significant concerns about the uh, robustness uh, of the uh, methodology and the forecasting uh, that has been used when it comes to the financial memorandum. Uh, could you comment on that uh, quite severe criticism? Well, the, in developing any financial memorandum, you have to engage with the experts and develop the um, develop that financial memorandum based on the research and uh, discussions that you've had, and that's why that's the way that this financial memorandum has been carried out. It's been uh, in close dialogue with people who know best. Could, could you provide the committee with uh, the uh, methodology um, for compiling the statistics that you have? and also why you consider uh, what the government has put forward uh, is a satisfactory uh, basis for the financial implications of the bill? Well, like I say, you know, the financial memorandum is drafted by after close dialogue and close working with people who know best, and those are the experts around the country that have um, been working um, in the day-to-day -day lives of children across the country. So uh, absolutely, you know, the, the financial memorandum is, is there and it's robust and it's... Um, and, and it's there for, of course, the, the committees to scrutinise, but it would be interesting to know what, what areas in particular, because there's lots of different elements to the bill if you've got a, an issue around one element of it and the, and the methodology behind it, what, what that is in uh, specific terms. Well, yes, I do. I mean, obviously, in the Financial uh, Committee's uh, report last week from the actual committee session, um, there were questions by John Mason, Michael McMahon, Kenny Gibson, Malcolm Chisholm and Gavin Brown all asking for very specific figures uh, to support uh, certain policy areas. And they are saying to varying degrees that it's based on best estimates uh, on uh, committee evidence uh, that is uh, not particularly robust when it comes to what the Scottish Government uh, has put forward. They say it's patchy in places and non-existent in others. Therefore, it's very difficult for the financial uh, Finance Committee to come up uh, with an understanding of, of 
what it is that the government believes uh, are these uh, statistics that make the bill uh, financially viable. Well, and is that in relation? Are you, are you asking me to, to tell you the methodology that we've used for what part yeah, of the I bill? Mean, the, at the Finance Committee, the bill team was asked very specifically to provide, as they were asked repeatedly, uh, to come up with uh, figures which would support uh, the government's implementation of policy, uh, and it appeared not to be forthcoming. So I wonder if you could give us it uh, well, just now. For instance, in terms of early learning and childcare, there has been discussions with uh, COSLA to agree the figures to enable us to provide within the financial memorandum the appropriate amounts that we believe would enable us to uh, increase to 600 hours. Sorry, Minister. On, on some aspects of this, I, I really want to get at what the Finance Committee uh, has asked for. Um, they're asking about very specific uh, evidence required when it comes to training and costs. Very clear that... Okay, yep. So when you were talking about in the, gen in the general of the bill, that there's many different elements to the bill with many different discussions having to go with many different types of stakeholders to enable us to come up with the best financial memorandum that we have. Well, so I was given one example there of the discussions we've had to deliver 600 hours. Well, so if it's around financial, training... Yeah, financial memorandum is very much about looking at the, the, the costs which underpin the bill. And it's, it's very clear from people in, in uh, Lothian Health Board, from the Royal College of Nursing, uh, from the Edin Edinburgh City Council, that they feel that the... Uh, Scottish Government has not provided sufficient money to support the ambitions of the bill. Do you agree with their concerns? Well, I, in terms of, I take it then it's getting down to the Guinea Gerfeck side of the, the bill as opposed to any other part of the bill that you're, you're having your, you're honing in on. Uh, well, in part, in but there are, there are other issues too. Okay, I guess it was just to try and find out which part of the bill you want to examine. In terms of, again, I go back, you know, we have uh, closely liaised with... Um, the relevant people to make sure that the, the financial memorandum that we've provided to accompany this bill is uh, as good as, as it can be. It will take on board all the different views and opinions that are, are going around around the, uh, the financial memorandum, but certainly in terms of what we have produced is what we believe is um, the right um, costings to adequately cope with the implementations of the uh, GERFEC provisions within the bill. Phil, would you like to answer any any further if it's specifically around the issues of training um, because clearly it's a different answer for a different set of costs mm -hmm. so whichever the specific issue is I'm very happy to provide that but if it's specifically with respect to training I know she mentioned the health um, the people we consulted with as the minister said are the people who have the most experience in being able to implement this if you will the most experience in designing a training and course implementing it and how that may develop over time and the specific groups we, uh, we spoke with with regard to health training was the, um, there's a group of managers who are uh, designated by each health board who have the uh, dedicated responsibility of implementing GERFEC within their own health board. Because as you'll be aware, GERFEC is not something new for health boards. It's been there um, as a result of the chief executive letter number 29 and as a result of Hall 4. So there's quite a lot of experience in about thinking about how this might roll out. So as that group, as well as the children, young people, um, children, young people and families nursery advisory group, um, remembering all these acronyms are quite complicated. With respect to local authorities, which is a different set of issues where indeed maybe the same criticisms has been raised by some with respect to training. Again, we spoke to the people who, as you would expect, who had response, who have quite a lot of experience in putting these things into, mat in, into practice rather than <laughs> consider it particularly in the abstract. We spoke to Highland Council, Edinburgh City Council, South Ayrshire, um, East Lothian, the Mid Lothian, um, Falkirk, um, Angus, a number of councils who are at different stages on the way uh, of implementing GERFEC. And you'll notice from the committee, the, the, the um, evidence that was submitted to the committee by those, by people who are well advanced in implementing GERFEC, not least Edinburgh City Council, not least South Ayrshire, um, that they have no problems with the, um, with certainly with the, for example, the um, the um, assumptions that have been made with regard to the GERFEC costs. Well, uh, forgive me for saying so, but the Finance Committee has a problem, and so do some other witnesses who are saying that they believe that they, um, the money that's been put forward to, to GERFEC may support it in the first instance, but the ongoing basis, there's not nearly enough money uh, for that. Um, and that's in, in several pieces of evidence. Uh, secondly, when it comes to uh, the provision of uh, health visitors, uh, the Royal College of Nursing has made it very clear that to implement the name person in full would mean another 450 
uh, health visitors across Scotland. They're making the claim that there isn't sufficient money. Are you absolutely confident that the uh, research that you've done is sufficiently robust to ensure that this bill has the right amount of money behind it to support the costs? Oh. Would you like to come in here? Um, well, certainly in terms of we've been very clear what we believe is required of health boards to fulfil the GERFEC duties, and we've worked out the additional hours required. Uh, Phil has talked about the different discussions that we've had with different expert groups who have expertise and knowledge about implementing um, GERFEC, and it's about making sure that what that this isn't an additional thing that people and services do. This is hardwired into the daily practice of the services, uh, and in the expect, you know, which is what we expect um, Gurfik, uh, how we expect Gurfik to be carried out. So, I okay, Minister, could I, could I just finish on the bit? Why, why is it? Do you believe that the finance committee from all parties uh, were so strong in their criticism about the financial mem memorandum? Well, I mean, they've, they've had a number of different people who have come and provided evidence uh, to them and have reflected that in their report. And, you know, like I say, you know, we'll listen to um, and look at the, the evidence that has been provided to you as the lead committee uh, and make sure that, that, that what we have is at the end of it is a bill that we can all be proud of. But certainly in terms of the way we've gone about approaching the financial memorandum, as Phil set out, it has been about engaging with the people who know best and what they've told us to develop the robust methodology that we have um, that's allowed us to create this financial memorandum. OK, could I just finish on the point? Do you believe that the bill has sufficient money behind it or will it have to have more behind it? Well, what we've got there is a financial memorandum that we believe sets out the way in which we can deliver on the aspirations of this bill. OK, thank you. Lee Robinson. Um, yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry, I, mean, I was um, um, listening to the, the, the minister there. I've lost my, my train of thought. Um, <coughs> yes, please. Uh, thank George, you. George sorry. Adam. Yes, Minister. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, I just want to ask, when we're asking some of the questions about the financial memorandum there, you know, the process you've gone through at this stage, it's basically the process you would go through in any bill at this stage when you're trying to work with other partner organisations, yeah, you know, ensuring that you're giving them the mm -hmm. opportunity to get some input into mm -hmm. the bill itself and at the same time work out how you can actually make it work out there in the real world. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But it's gone this is the same approach that any financial memorandum takes. It's about making sure that you engage with the experts who know best to give you the the right information to develop something that will work alongside the bill that you're developing in policy terms. Claire. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, uh, one, one of the, 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 um, the finance report did pick up on was the, the, the savings that are, are, are um, uh, in, uh, planned um, through um, the implementation of GIFEC. And I wonder if we could maybe give us just a bit more information about the um, evidence that's been given from the local authorities about the financial savings through GIFEC? Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of the, the Highland uh, Pathfinder, there has been very real um, evidence there of the not only the, the savings in terms of cost, but the savings in terms of time and um, meetings and all those different things that can maybe impede upon getting that right um, a service for that, that child. So um, even after a short period of time, there's clear benefits have been generated um, from the, the GERFEC uh, approach, inappropriate referrals to the children's reporters, such like, you know, there's a lot of evidence there to show that this has worked and given uh, real benefits and savings to, to the local authority. Okay. There, there's also been a, a bit of evidence about questioning whether the, the sort of front-loading initial um, additional monies for one year are, are sufficient, but is, does the evidence from the rollout in Highland suggest that that, um, that is enough to get this embedded into the normal working practices, the job descriptions of the people involved in it, and it, it then becomes part of their professional <laughs> development as they're going forward? Yeah, and um, you know, I think the other thing, I think you know, the evidence that you got from from Bill Bill Alexander was was quite compelling as well. And you know, we're not starting from a a static standpoint. There has been an awful lot of work through the GERFEC implementation board, through the work that we've done uh, as a government to um, finance um, the the greater awareness of GERFEC and the implementation of it. But you know, now that we've got the financial memorandum to accompany that, we've got the the transition into uh, over for for training to enable 
then thereafter professionals to have this part of their, their ongoing training uh, and CPD. Um, and again, you know, there's been discussions with you know, Edinburgh, South Ayrshire about how that may be rolled out and they've been useful in helping us develop the, the financial memorandum and the approach that we've outlined in the bill. Thank you. Neil Bibby. Thanks. Just to, just to follow up on the issue of resources, I know Minister, you're saying that you believe there's adequate resources in the, in the financial memorandum, uh, but given the concerns raised by the Finance Committee and other concerns we've heard by, by, uh, to this committee about resources, would you consider reviewing the costs associated in the financial memorandum, given the concerns that were raised about um, the name person element of the bill around issues around training, administration and support? Would you consider reviewing you, the, you, the figures, given the concerns? Well, we always monitor what, what's going on in a bill. And as well, it's always important to re realise and recognise as well that this is, you know, that there's continually, there's continual engagement between health, for instance, between health boards and the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, as well about the, uh, ensuring the capacity for, for people to deliver on the aspirations with set out in this bill. Okay. Okay. Can I just follow up on one of these, one or two of these questions? You talked a moment ago about um, the amount of money required to deal with some of these issues in terms of costs, training, etc. But I wanted to ask about the profile in terms of, for example, the additional hours that would be expected. Um, uh, you mentioned again Highland uh, several times. Highland Council said they were talk well, they talked about green shoots, which suggests it's early days still in terms of saving. And I'm just wondering, uh, given that the profile at the moment in terms of the additional hours, the assumption in the financial, financial memorandum about reduced named person hours after the first year seems, certainly to a number of people who have spoken to us and written to us, uh, overly optimistic. What's your response to that? Well, there, I mean, I've outlined some of the benefits already being experienced um, and have been evidenced through the, the research done on the Highland Pathfinder over quite a short short period uh, of time. Um, and also we've done our own, own bespoke uh, economic modelling that for every pound you invest in, in the early years saves you nine pound in cure. So there's a number of bits of research as well that show us that you know you, you will see um, benef financial benefits um, after making that initial investment in the early years. Um, but in terms of those specific points that you raised, uh, Phil, can you can you comment? Absolutely. I guess there are different ways of thinking about it. It depends if you're thinking more of the local authority side of things and the health mm -hmm. side of things. Uh, it might be helpful maybe to start with the health side of things. One of the reasons why um, it's noticeable that there is what you might say an ongoing um, cost associated with the, the role of health in regard to implementing the, the, the GERFIC provisions within the bill, I think is a recognition that um, if you really want to make a difference in a child's life, you really have to do it in the first couple of years of their life. And therefore, that making that kind of major impact and the fact that major impact is going to be there year on year as you go forward is reflected in those kind of assumptions. But even there, you would expect there to be, a, I guess, a tapering effect. You would expect as as the role bedded down universally, that there would be certain efficiencies, economy scale, people got better at doing their job. Midwives would be better at doing the pre-birth screening and conferencing and handing over to health visitors. Health visitors would get very good at being able to do something in the first year of a child's life, and therefore in the second, third, and fourth years, uh, you would expect there to be less need for supporting a family, um, particularly some of the crisis families. And then when they hand that over, if you will, to um, um, local authorities in their role of um, um, being the named person through education, you'd expect those kind of savings, those kind of th that work to bear fruit as you go down the line, and it to, maybe to kick in quite early, because the work you do in the first year of a child's life, the additional work you do, should be starting to bear fruit as you get into the later years of that, that individual child's life. That's, that's interesting. I mean, I think that obviously we all hope that early intervention will have that knock-on effect. Um, uh, not particularly, my top priority would not be the financial savings, but the impact on the individual's life, Absolutely. and I'm sure we share that view. Yeah. I just want to dr drill down a little bit on, on this idea about how early these financial savings can be achieved from GERFIC. Um, could you give us specific examples of what the kind of savings we're talking about? Are we talking about bureaucracy savings, savings in the paperwork? Are we talking about um, um, the ability, or rather the, the expectation, that we will not be having to intervene um, in that child's life to the same extent in future years. Um, I'm just wondering exactly how the savings will be made. Um, is it financial savings? Is it time savings? Is it both? And are we, I, I come back to the question, are we really confident that in year one we make these interventions and in year two and three, almost immediately, we get these savings? That's, that's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Well, the benefits um, 
should be the, to, fam to families, fewer meetings with professionals, uh, greater clarity about who they should contact, um, earlier support, preventing things getting worse. So that is in terms of meetings and bureaucracy, yes, there is a, there's a saving there in terms of the, the money that um, accompanies some of those bits of bits of bureaucracy, there's a, a cost saving there too. It'll benefit professionals, they'll be able to free up their time to be able to work with families who are, who are more, more vulnerable uh, as well. So there's clear benefits um, to families as well as the kind of cost saving and the professional time saving um, in, term, uh, in terms of implementing GERFEC. Um, one of the other, I mean, it's aside from this, but you know, for instance, family nurse partnerships is quite, it's getting rolled out across the country and working with um, first time young teenage mothers. Uh, some of the evidence from that has shown quite clear, quickly that there's been, you know, subsequent children are, that they may have don't, don't happen uh, as quickly to the birth of their first child. So that's quite a quick saving. Uh, they've, they're empowered, they're much better at being a, being a parent. So there's quite real savings to that child um, and the, the, the mother of that child as well. Um, if that's helpful. Okay, I, I just want one final question before we, we move on to another section of the bill. Um, and it's to do with the health visitors. We, we, it's been touched upon already, but I just want to ask, could you provide the committee with um, some detail around what workforce planning is actually being undertaken by the Scottish Government in terms of the, the issue about health visitors? Because clearly it has come up repeatedly mm -hmm. that, um, in very strong evidence, that the, the bill and its accompanying um, various memorandums are, are not providing sufficient health visitor cover for the for successful implementation of the bill. Um, now, we've had that evidence. Now, the, the government may or may not agree or disagree with that. But what workforce planning is, is currently being undertaken to ensure that, in fact, that we have the correct number of health visit visitors, never mind midwives or others. Let's, let's focus on health visitors for a moment. I mean, a lot of the work we're doing will always inform health boards about the responsibilities in regard of workforce planning. Um, you know, nurse directors, chief executives of NHS boards will be making um, the appropriate provision in light of the fact that this will be a, a new bill uh, on the landscape. And again, you know, there will be regular discussions as well with the uh, cabinet secretary um, with his regular contact that he has with NHS boards. There's been comment to this committee and, and, and comment indeed in the press about irrespective of this bill, irrespective of the rollout of family nurse partnerships, that there's pressure on the number of um, health visitors we currently have, that we have insufficient number of health visitors, there's pressure on the individuals who are currently in those roles. Um, in, in what way will this bill and the rollout of family nurse partnerships impact on uh, individual health visitors, and are we sure that we have sufficient numbers to actually achieve the ends that we all want to see? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, again, you know, going back to what Bill Alexander had said, that health visitors in, in Highland feel empowered and feel um, much more highly regarded in terms of the professional work that they do. Um, we're already seeing a, a growth in, in, um, in, the, in this um, profession as well. Um, Phil, would you like to comment as well? Because I mean, the other thing is as well that the, kind of the, the ratios as well are, are quite, quite healthy in, in, in Scotland, I suppose, in terms of... Um, the health visitors and, their, um, uh, and the, the children that they're dealing with. Uh, thank you, Minister. I, I wonder if there's, there's some specific things that are going on. I mean, I guess one thing to say is clearly the financial memorandum sets out a cost. It doesn't set out the funding required. It doesn't particularly, as you wouldn't expect, to say how that, uh, I guess that work, if you will, which should be generated through, through the bill will be uh, taken forward by individual health boards. That's clearly something that individual health boards have to reflect upon and also have to enter into discussion, as you expect, as part of the natural budgetary negotiations that would be going on uh, in future. But we've been, one of the important things is recognizing the fact that this bill is also sitting amongst a, a number of other issues, I think, with regard to health visitor workloads and, and I guess expectations about them, is that there's a lot of work been going on with the, um, it's a group I mentioned before, the Children, Young People and Families Nursery Advisory Group, about developing uh, tools that will enable health boards to much more quickly assess what they're, um, what, given all these different um, uh, demands, if you will, that might be coming down in future with, with regard to health visitors, what that what that demand will look like, so they, so they can very quickly make the assessment about how that might translate into the need for future numbers. Now, that's work that's going on at the moment, as you would expect to be appropriately, will feed into future budget negotiations, and clearly, 
given the, the commencement of the duties we're talking about here, we are talking about budgets that are not envisaged at the moment. But that workforce planning is going on. It is going on. And, and to be honest, the health boards have been well aware of the need to be doing that ever since Hall 4, ever since Cell 29, that GERFIC was coming. And they've been putting those sort of mechanisms in place for thinking about what it might look like in local areas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, George Adam. Yes, Minister, uh, I'd like to ask you about early education and care. Basically, you're talking about the 600 hours uh, nursery care that uh, the government's offering, which is uh, offering greater flexibility for parents. Now, during some committee evidence that we had, it was Laurie Summers that said uh, it needs to be more flexible so that a place is available, not just in the morning or afternoon. Now, do you believe what, we've, what you've put in place is actually offer that flexibility to someone like Laurie Summers? Well, um, you know, the, the whole reason for increasing the hours has been to, you know, to help, help families who are struggling balance work and life, but the flexibility um, should also help uh, families because they'll be able to um, input into the, the, the way in which the local authority will configure the services to enable them to either enter work or, or training. So that flexibility um, is crucial in the way in which those six, those additional hours are going to be uh, delivered because they enable family will, will, will enable families to uh, enter work or, or training. So um, yeah, absolutely, I think it's an important uh, part of this bill, which is crucial in terms of delivery. It's not just about adding on extra hours; it's about making change in the way in which this is delivered. Okay, then uh, one of the other questions I want to ask, just so we've got it again on the record, obviously you have to work with partner organisations again to deliver this. Obviously you've had conversations with COSLA and things are uh, at a reasonable state where mm -hmm. we can this can be delivered then, Minister? Yeah, absolutely. There's been very close working uh, with uh, COSLA in developing these uh, figures. Um, also, uh, aside from the work of the bill, there's the Early Years Task Force, which COSLA um, are, are part and parcel of. In fact, they co-chair it along with um, myself and the chief medical officer. So, uh, and there's been an, awful, an, an enormous amount of work getting done in terms of delivering um, early learning uh, and childcare, um, and developing the, the financial uh, memorandum uh, as well. So, close working. We have to recognise they're very big partners in, in terms of delivering this uh, aspiration to increase the hours and the flexibility of the provision. One of the other things that came up as well, Minister, was the fact that uh, it will offer greater access to qualified teachers, but at the same time it won't just be qualified teachers. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe explain some of that mm -hmm. uh, thinking as well? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the other reason for making sure that we deliver this in a, in a, in a good way is because we recognise it has to be a quality offering to um, children in their youngest years. So. That may mean as well that there's there's teachers part of uh, are part of the the workforce, but there's also the 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 BA childhood practice, the the nursery managers as well, who are uh, a crucial part of the 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 mix of professionals working with uh, children. So, um, an awful lot of work being done to make sure that they've got the appropriate skills to be enable us to be confident that what is being offered to children is a quality a quality service. Um, Education Scotland last year published a report which showed the, the positive benefits of um, upskilling this workforce um, and showed that they are making really good good progress in terms of delivering something that's um, going to be good for the development of developmental needs of the three and four year olds that we're talking about. So you're saying regardless of the makeup of an actual nursery, it's the quality that's the most important thing, the delivery on the ground? Absolutely, the quality. I mean, this has to be, you know, we've talked about how we're wanting to deliver this in a flexible way for families, but it has to be a quality provision as well to reflect the, the real needs of children of that age. Um, the Education Scotland report was, was, was useful last year when they published it because it showed that that uh, that work that has been ongoing in Scotland for a number of years to make sure that the workforce is uh, appropriately trained is paying dividends and um, that there's a real need for a mix of um, abilities within the, the workforce and a mix of professionals to enable us to be confident that what we're delivering for three and four year olds is a quality offering as well as being flexible and meeting the needs of parents um, and carers as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Kavina. Just to follow up on the, the issue of, of, of quality, I think as both um, Liz Smith and, and Neil Bibby have, have indicated uh, previously, the, the, um, uh, the, financial the Finance Committee's assessment of the Financial Memorandum, I, I, I think, 
raises some very serious questions. I can't remember seeing a, a report from the Finance Committee on any other bill um, that has raised quite so many uh, serious concerns. And one of them uh, was in relation to uh, funding for partner providers, which presumably is linked to the issue of, of quality of provision that, that George Adams was referring to. Uh, the NDNA, in their evidence, uh, both to the Finance Committee and to our own committee, highlighted um, fairly significant discrepancies in terms of the, uh, the rates that are paid uh, on an average of 3.28 per child um, per hour uh, from £4.9 uh, £4 at the top end through to I think, Glasgow paying £2.72 uh, uh, per hour uh, at the, the low end. Uh, given that there is an operating process that is based on assumptions of, of, of payments that are made, um, could you perhaps um, uh, advise the committee what the status of those uh, presumed rates uh, are and whether there's more that needs to be done to ensure um, that adequate payments are being, uh, are being made to allow the, the quality of provision we all want to see? Okay, so it's, I mean, it's up to you know, it's up for, to local authorities to decide on the local settlements with par partner providers that are uh, fair and sustainable. But certainly, the the budget associated with the bill um, is reflects the and would cover an uplift for the additional 20, 125 hours. Uh, which local authorities would pay partner providers for. But, but given that you're trying to make assumptions on the, the, the funding that's required and that there is uh, a, an assumed um, uh, sort of rationale behind uh, the, the figures that are being paid uh, to partner providers, um, do you not think that there uh, perhaps uh, ought to be more of a consistency in terms of what paid, not necessarily a, a specific rate uh, paid, but, but not the sort of discrepancies that we're seeing uh, mm -hmm. between, on the one hand, £4.9 uh, per child per hour um, uh, as compared to £2.72? Mm -hmm. And again, it is for hour. local authorities to decide with their, um, their partner providers about what that settlement would look like, but it has to be, from my point of view, it would have to be a, a fair and sustainable um, a settlement and in the best interests of the child and in the interests of the local authority of a responsibility to secure a good quality provision. But as I said, you know, the um, the bill, the financial memorandum um, um, covers the uplift for the additional 125 hours. If I can maybe move it on to another area, again flagged up by the, the, the Finance Committee, which I think um, raises concerns about the, the, the assumptions and, uh, that have been made in uh, putting together the financial memorandum. It relates to the funding for um, uh, provision for looked after uh, two-year-olds, which uh, obviously last month there was an announcement uh, from yourself that this was being um, increased from 1.1 million to I think 4.5 million pounds now. That's welcome, um, presumably on the basis that it, it now addresses concerns that were being raised um, to you directly about the uh, uh, the costs involved in providing uh, for this group. But as one witness um, suggested to the Finance Committee, uh, quote, if one element of cost can go up fourfold after they've been thought about more, can other elements of cost do the same? If they could, the shortfall would be significant. On that basis, can you perhaps explain um, uh, the, uh, the, the thinking, the process that, that resulted in a fourfold increase in the uh, funding for um, this element of the, of the mm -hmm. bill's provisions. And I, I set out in my letter to the, the Finance Committee um, about, w about why we, we came to that decision and it's, um, it's um, integrating money and adding in additional money, and I think that would ordinarily be uh, recognised as a good thing, putting in new money into uh, into a bill. I, well, I, I, I don't dispute that, and better it's done now than um, at, at some point uh, hence. But you'll understand that this has, uh, I think, raised concerns about um, the adequacy of the assumptions that were made uh, when the, uh, the the bill was being put together and the financial memorandum was being put together. But you've you've indicated that 3.4 million does represent additional funding as opposed to realignment of, of funding through the early years mm -hmm. change fund. Is that, is that correct? Well, you know, again, you know, it's, you know this is, a, I would have thought, would be welcome that we're putting in additional money to make sure that we can deliver something that we're proud of or looked after for two-year-olds. We've set out in the, the, the letter that I gave to the Finance Committee that this is to be read alongside the, um, uh, the, the financial memorandum, and we've developed many of these figures in conjunction with uh, COSLA. Yeah, OK, well, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, I must arrange, you 
suggested earlier on that to make a major impact, uh, you need to uh, be intervening in the first couple of years of their life. Clearly, um, this is being addressed in terms of uh, looked after two-year-olds. Um, it will be no secret to the Minister that um, I believe we ought to be going uh, further in terms of the evidence that we've had um, to this the committee from, from uh, <laughs> as, as opposed to your part of piece. <laughs> trying to hold the government to account, George, and like yourself. Um, save the children oh, have made. Oh, oh, no, 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 save no. the children <laughs> have made the uh, give us the evidence that um, they support an extension to two-year-olds starting with children living in poverty as much as anything to tackle inequalities in the early, early years and recognising that many two-year-olds um, from better off backgrounds do currently enjoy uh, early education and, and nursery provision. Is this an area where you're prepared to uh, concede any ground, not least given Claire Telfer went on to say that uh, we support the priority being given to children living in poverty. We want to see that taken forward immediately, looking at how and whether that is possible and certainly through this session of Parliament. Um, well, you know, what I am keen to do, as I've said, uh, I think, to George Adam, is to deliver something that is of quality to the children that we are wanting to um, uh, deal with. So three and four years and looked after two year olds who are the most vulnerable uh, two year olds in, in society. And we want to make sure that we can deliver that in a sustainable, manageable way uh, that does have quality uh, as its hallmark. What I'm not prepared to do is to sort of just announce something that we can't then deliver on later on, which I think has been the case uh, in other parts of the UK, where announcements are made and actually the well, sectors say that well, they can't deliver on that. To There's be no honest, capacity to be honest, there. You, you are so, guilty of doing that, Minister, with all due respect, in that you published a bill in a financial memorandum and delivery for looked after two year olds that was a quarter of what was actually required. Delivered a, we're putting forward a bill with a financial memorandum. I've announced extra money to go into that, which COSLA are. are, are content with as well, that we worked in conjunction with COSLA. And what I've announced uh, within the bill is a system of childcare that will um, deliver for three and four year olds isn't about, isn't in uh, contrary to the, the capacity that we have in the country and will ensure that at the end of the bill, 600 hours will be delivered in a quality way to three and four year olds and looked after too. So now there is would be provision uh, within the bill as well at a later date if, if, if we need to, to extend that. But, um, you know, this is the first step in transforming childcare uh, and making sure that we make that step in a, in a way that is sustainable is important because we don't want to sort of say something that we can't deliver on it once this bill is enacted. Well, I, I have to say, on the, base, on the basis that, that that announcement was made without the adequate funding, but it's clear... Uh, uh, no, 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 we've made this, we've made this, saved, we've made this financial the, memorandum... I've, and we Interrupt you, Minister. I do apologise, but <laughs> let's let's let Liam can okay. ask the question, and, and then if you come okay. back, uh, briefly, I apologise. I yeah. appreciate. I say that I, I mean I appreciate that um, uh, any bill is, it, it, of this nature is likely to introduce something in a phased uh, in a phased way. What say the children are telling us is that part of this um, phased introduction uh, of uh, of early learning childcare can be done by extending to uh, children living in poverty, two-year-olds uh, living in poverty uh, over the course of this session uh, of the Parliament. Uh, and therefore, uh, I, I'm trying to ascertain whether or not uh, you are in any way open, as you've demonstrated or, or, or indicated you are in relation to other parts of the bill, mm -hmm. uh, to listening to those uh, arguments and looking to, to mm. review whether the bill in its current form can be extended further to include... Well, it can be with secondary legislation. So you're not prepared to do that as part what of... I'm, what I am doing is making sure that what we deliver for three and four-year-olds and looked after two is done in a manageable way. What I don't want is to see... Um, headlines in the paper like we've seen in other parts of the UK where the sector has said that there's not the capacity there. We've seen arguments over ratios, uncertainty there. What That's not what I'm prepared to do uh, when we're delivering childcare for three and four year olds. We want this to be a quality offering done in a manageable and a sustainable way and that's what we're achieving through the provisions in this bill and the funding that goes along with it. Okay. Thank in you. A, in, a, in a country where Thank ratios you. are higher. So, I'm, sorry I'm Liam, no, I, I interrupted Minister. I'm going to interrupt you. Let's we'll, we'll okay. conclude there. We'll move on to the next area of question. We're running out of time and I want to get through the, some important issues. Uh, Jane Baxter. Thanks, convener. <clears throat> Morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, aftercare and I wonder whether the Minister would support the proposal by Who Cares Scotland, Aberlour and Bernardo's to rename aftercare as continuing care services for the purpose of party of the bill. 
which seeks to align Part 8 of the Bill with Part 7's corporate parenting duties, which place a continued duty on corporate parents towards young care leavers to 26 years of age. Um, what we're going to, to do is, and I've been listening with uh, real interest, the discussions you've had with um, the, the providers of, of the information that, that you've got and looking at their real interest and, their, their, and have valued the input the committee has had in terms of looked after children as well, um, and particularly the issue around through care and after care, because that's it's crucial. We want to make sure that we get things right, that's based on the, the needs of the child, based at, and that through care and after care is provided at a point that's um, relevant to, to that uh, child. Um, stage two amendments... We can, we can look at and we can discuss them and we'd welcome views from the committee in their stage one report and we'll continue to take a real interest in the discussions that are ongoing on this issue. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, the Minister will be aware that birth parents have a legal duty to care for their children up to the age of 18, even if that child leaves at the age of 16 but decides to return home for further support. Why does the duty of care to look after children held by the corporate parent finish when they turn 16? And as I said again, you know, we want to make sure that the decisions taken about a child when they leave care are done um, and in the best interest of the child and when it's insensitive to their needs. So it's not our policy to encourage young people to leave care before they're ready. And that's reflected in all the, the current regulations and guidance that, that we have. OK. So therefore, would the Minister agree that Part 8, as it's currently proposed, places an unnecessary responsibility on vulnerable young people to seek the help they need. It would be better if they were consistently, routinely and appropriately assessed. Do you think that would be better, rather than them having to come and, and seek out the help they need on an ongoing basis? Well, you know, the, the point in which a, a young person uh, makes the transition into independent living is a time when, they need, when they're very vulnerable and they need to be uh, supported. And if they want that help, then they, they can get that help. And that's what we want to make sure is the case, that when they make that transition into independence, that at that very vulnerable point in time of their lives that they have the support that's necessary that they want to enable them to go on and flourish. Do you agree that they might need additional support to enable them to know what facilities and resources are available to them? Should it be up to them to go and find it? Should someone be looking out for them? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, like I, like I say, you know, the point when they try to make that transition into independence, if there is a, a need there for them to be require support, then that should then their needs should uh, should be met. And, you know, there's provisions in the, across the whole bill in terms of the named person and other areas and elements within the bill to make sure that that support is is provided to that to that young person. But again, yeah, I'm very interested in the in the dialogue and discussions that you've been having with the likes of Who Cares and others about um, the way in which we can make sure we get this part of the bill absolutely mm -hmm. right because, you know, maybe far too often you hear about stories where that support hasn't always been there and what can we do to make sure that that support is in place. Uh, very interested in these discussions that you're having around the 26-year-old as well um, to make mm -hmm. uh, sure that the, the support that we've got in, in place <coughs> is, is adequate and allows these young folk to not have uh, outcomes that are any different from uh, their peers who are not looked after. OK. So one of the fundamentals of that then is... Yeah, OK. Is the elig eligibility criteria. Um, the criteria for aftercare sets the qualifying threshold for the support as being, as being in care on the day that the child can legally leave school. Wouldn't the Minister agree that the qualifying threshold for aftercare support should actually recognise the impact of a child's journey through the care system, regardless of when they cease to be looked after? Yet yeah, again, sympathetic to some of those those views that are coming through when we're um, looking at the, the bill through the um, progression through, through Parliament. But again, just stress that my real and very keen interest on the discussions that you have been having around this uh, area because it is something that we need to, to get right to enable those young people who are leaving here to have the right support and to uh, go on and have the outcomes that we expect uh, that they deserve. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a brief supplementary from Liam. Thank you, uh, convener. I can um, echo the, the, the sentiments of Jane Baxter and I'm, I'm grateful for the, the, uh, the willingness you've shown to, to take those on board. Perhaps one follow-up question is in relation to um, the role local authorities have and the decisions they take about the, the, the care that's provided. Um, there's been some concern expressed about um, the scope for appealing decisions um, from local authorities and whether or not 
<coughs> there steps need to be taken uh, to address that, uh, and perhaps as part of that, whether or not a right to uh, advocacy support in, in order to, to prosecute that, that case as effectively as possible is something that perhaps needs to be uh, looked at again. Is, are, are those both areas where either work's being done or, uh, or you're prepared to, to look at through stage two and stage three? Now, in terms of advocacy, there has been work ongoing <coughs> about advocacy. There was a consultation through the summer there about making uh, about about advocacy, and we'll reflect on 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 that. Um, Again, I just go back. You know, we want to make this this bit of the bill work, and we need to. You know, if if there are areas or gaps in the provision that we've laid out in the bill, then we'll we'll, we'll look and listen to what the, the the committee has been told and your um, and your report. Uh, David, would you like to come in on any of the specifics around the? Um, what was the, the gap? The, the, the decisions taken by local authorities and, and, and how those might be a, a, appealed, where there's appeal, there's the appeal either not, not provision or inadequate provision. Sure. I mean, in terms of looked after, uh, in terms of care leavers in particular, um, one of the things that we've been working with um, uh, who cares on actually in relation to this particular idea is um, is that um, is that issue. And I think part of what we're trying to avoid is creating more and more bureaucratic systems to compensate for the bureaucratic systems. Because the whole principle of the um, care leaving provisions is about trying to normalise um, the care experience for uh, for young people leaving care. So um, one of the things we're talking about is, um, and and this is about, this isn't government policy. This is about the, the legitimate sort of work that we're doing to help them pin down exactly what they're trying to get at. Um, one of the things that um, we're, we're looking at is trying to um, move away from that so that m there's more power in, in the hands of the, I should say, there's more emphasis put on the quality of the relationship between the social worker or the relevant person in the child's life who's making a decision and the child or the young person. Um, what that means is, is another question that requires a bit more work, but it would be preferable, I think, um, I should say, it, in principle, I should say, in terms of the uh, point of what we're trying to achieve with the bill. Um, if we can move to a system more like that, because that starts to replicate the sort of relationship that a normal, um, a, you know, a child or a normal family would have when they are asking for something from a parent. Um, so that's what we're trying to get at. We're working with them, who cares, um, on some of the detail in advance of uh, stage two to, to, to help make, uh, to m help put some meat in the bones um, so we know what we can, we know how to, 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 to scope it and react later. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, Neil Bibby. Thanks. I uh, just wanted to ask you a couple of questions about kinship care, Minister. Um, we've heard concerns um, of from some kinship carers, particularly kinship carers of looked after children, uh, that they uh, may get a, a lower level of support um, if they were to obtain a kinship care order. Can I ask you, Minister, what is the incentive for a kinship carer of a looked after child to apply for, a, for the new kinship care order? So this is about trying to... Uh, provide an enhanced form of permanence within kinship care. Um, it's also about recognising the the needs, the best needs of the the best interests of the child as well, and about recognising that that's not always best served by having that formal looked after status. So the kinship care order um, would allow for anyone making the transition from being formally looked after into an informal kinship care setting to receive uh, support uh, to recognise that there may be issues that in areas where that family does need support but doesn't have the intrusive intervention of, of the state, which is what being formally looked after uh, means. Okay. Um, by, by moving... Um the child from looked after to non looked after status, the kinship carer may gain entitlement to welfare benefits such as uh, child tax credit and child benefit. Can you, Minister, clarify whether the value of these benefits would be deducted from any transitional financial allowance paid by the local authority? Um, so, there's, I think within the bill there's a, a, a right to transitional uh, support, so that the package of support uh, that existed for the child and carer continues for a period of time once that. A child uh, leaves uh, care. Is it within the policy memorandum uh, on page 28 that you can see that the details uh, of that uh, in terms of financial support and general carers of looked after children are not eligible for child benefit or child tax credit. The local authority pays uh, allowances, so informal carers, including those with a kinship care order, generally are eligible. So the kinship care order should sh shift some of that burden um, to the benefit system. And 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 the value. They would, be they would be deducted from any transitional financial allowance paid by the local authority, the, the amount of money from the, the, the benefits gained from the DWP. 
sorry, the the amount of if, if for an informal or formal care. If if you if you move a child from looked after to non looked after status uh -huh. through the kinship care order, yeah. being able, uh, entitled to benefits, as you said, um, can you clarify where these benefits would be deducted from the transitional financial allowance paid by the local authority? Well, in informal kinship carers shouldn't. There shouldn't be a, a problem with them interacting with the, the DWP. The issue is always around the, the formal kinship carer. But David, do you have an example there? You would I like think to just to clarify this one. I mean, it's 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 we didn't design this to be complicated. What we said in um, uh, paragraph one twenty one of page twenty eight is um, what we modelled was um, where a, a kinship carer um, has petitioned for a kinship care order, and the effect of that is that a child leaves care. Um, Compared with now, where they're not entitled to any ongoing financial support, um, if they had, say, and this is an example, um, an allowance of around £150 a week from a local authority um, while the child was looked after, um, once the child leaves care, um, you would expect that um, carer, if they rely on benefits, to have a cleaner relationship with the benefit system. They would claim, in the normal course of things, child benefit, child tax credit, which would take them up to a certain level anyway. Um, what we modelled was a top-up payment from local authorities to make sure that there was a sort of parity whilst uh, they received transitional support. That's what it was designed to do. Okay, that's, that's so it would be deducted? Yeah. Well, they wouldn't be entitled to a full, the same allowance under the kinship care order because it wouldn't make any sense to squeeze out the benefit system to people who would, be, who would have an underlying entitlement. Just for absolute clarity here, if it wasn't... Uh, if that uh, it wasn't done in the way you suggested, it, it would possibly mean that moving from looked after status to non looked after status in this way yeah. would result in an increase yes. in payments, which is rather perverse. Yes. Um, so the effect is to effectively level it out. Yeah. That's the purpose of it, right? So I think it's helpful. Thank you. Um, Colin PD. Mr. The part five of the bill allows for a child's plan if a child requires targeted intervention. Now, and there's been a number of submissions to the to the committee and co expressing concern about how that might work, particularly the, how you would operate a child's plan alongside statutory and non-statutory plans which are required also. How would you bring all that together into one plan? Does the bill adequately address that? The, the bill is not intended to increase um, any bureaucracy at all. It's about making sure that we, what we have at the end of the day is something that's much more coordinated uh, in its approach. And the intention is not to alter the specific statutory duties to prepare a coordinated support plan or a plan for a child who is looked after. Um, those, uh, all those plans would be considered part of the broader framework in supporting the well-being of the, the individual or the young person. Uh, and much of the, the detail on that would be included in any subordinate legislation that we have or prepare or any guidance that we would prepare as well. Do, do you think that uh, it's an obstacle to GERFEC being uh, adequately introduced if you don't have that sort of integration, if you don't have more integration uh, detailed in the bill? Well, what we've got within the bill is providing a framework to ensure that the, the adequate um, integration allows for the child to benefit from the best possible uh, service and um, you know again you'll point to the information you've had from from Bill Alexander and, and the Highlands as well about how that much more coordinated approach has reduced an awful lot of bureaucracy an awful lot of uh, of the kind of things that can hold up the the child and getting the right services that they need so this is uh, intended to to enhance the service that children get just a final quick question. Yeah, this new framework of well-being and the child's plan being introduced, does it create a need to review the Education Additional Support for Learning Act 2004 and the Looked After Children Scotland Regulations 2006? Uh, you know, and also the guidance and assessment reporting and curriculum for excellence. I mean, everything. Is there a knock-on effect? There's, you know, that GERFEC is not about something that's added on. Uh, to the way in which we deal with, with young people uh, and children in Scotland. It's about making that part and parcel of how you do business. Um, uh, and so, um, I guess, cognizance will need to be taken uh, about the new legislative landscape once this bill is taken through. Uh, and in terms of what I, what I described to you in, about the, the, the child's plan, making sure that all those other bits of legislation properly dovetail to enable the best possible service to be um, given to, to that child. Thank you. Neil Bibby. Thanks. Just, um, 
just on the, the, the issue of the, the financial memorandum, um, obviously you, you believe there's sufficient resources in the bill, and, and I would urge you again, given the, the, the um, points raised by the Finance Committee and the evidence that we've heard, to, 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 review, the, to review the costs in that. Just, just a question around um, what, what happens if there isn't sufficient resources? What, what happens if um, what, what's the government's backup plan if extra resources are required for implementation after the bill is passed? Well, I said well, we always monitor what the, the impact will be, but you know, aside from the, the 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 financial memorandum, there are the regular dialogues that the government has with the appropriate providers around the budgets. Obviously, I hear you saying you'll, you'll monitor the situation. I guess, I guess what I'm asking is, is what, what would happen if the, the Scottish Government has, has undertaken to fully fund aspects of this bill and there, say there isn't enough money for the implementation of it, what would then happen? Would the cost fall to the local well, authorities, but, for example, well, or the Scottish Government step in? Is there a, is there a kind of contingency plan if, if you don't have enough money well, in the bill? Again, it's, you know, aside from the, the financial memorandum, it's aside from the, the fact that there will be ongoing and regular dialogue between government and local authorities and health boards, um, given the, the new la legislative landscape about uh, budgets. OK, thanks. OK, um, Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes uh, our evidence taking at stage one. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the organisations and the individuals who have taken the time to provide oral and written evidence to the committee. As ever, this material will assist us as we consider our stage one report. Uh, Minister, just before you go, can I um, just inform you that obviously there's a number of questions that we've been unable to cover this morning and we'd be, we'll be writing to you um, to cover those ones and hopefully yeah, be no, able I'd to respond. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to, you know, I understand that it's a big and complex bill and if there are additional issues that you want to raise, then by all means, please do get in contact and, um, you know, as I've said, in terms of the government's dialogue with other stakeholders, we want to keep that dialogue with you going as well to make sure that we do get the bill that we, that we want to uh, achieve and create. Thank you, Thank you very much and I now suspend the meeting while we change witnesses. Thank you.
Now, our third item today is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's 2014-15 draft budget. Uh, we have agreed to focus our scrutiny on the Scottish Government's youth employability commitments, funding for these, and how the policy focus on younger learners Im is impacting on lifelong learning. Can I welcome to the committee Michael Russell, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, and his supporting officials from the Scottish Government, Mike Fowlis, Director of Children and Families, Andrew Scott, Director of Employability, Skills and Lifelong Learning, and Fiona Robertson, Director of Learning. Um, before I move to the questions, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to make some uh, brief opening remarks? I shall be brief. I just would like, uh, if possible, Convener, to give a, a sort of overview of, of what is before you in the Budget. I, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to discuss this, and there's a considerable amount of detail in the Budget in front of you. Uh, basically, I would sum up what we're trying to do in last year and this year, to close the attainment gap. And those of you who have heard, for example, people like Pazi Salberg talk about this in, in some of his visits to Scotland will know how important it is to demand greater equity from our education system, while at the same time creating opportunities for people to develop skills in our colleges and encourage excellence and ambition in our universities. Our aim is to make what is a good system a, a great system once again, and we have a clear framework and a programme of investment amounting to about £3 billion a year to help make that happen. In the early years, we're tending to deliver the best childcare package in the UK, and you've been taking evidence this morning on the bill, and, and I'm sure you will continue to consider that matter. Uh, 121,000 Scottish children will benefit from the increase of 470 hours to a minimum of 600 hours. Hard-pressed Scottish families will save the equivalent of £707 per child per year on these costs. We're providing £50 million over the period of the spending review to support a range of early years initiatives, £10 million in the third sector strategic funding partnerships, as well as £20 million in the third sector early intervention fund. And that represents a sizable increase in our early years support. Those investments will be significant in helping us to get it right for every child in Scotland. Within our schools, we're continuing to invest in Curriculum for Excellence as well as driving up attainment. And indeed, Curriculum for Excellence is a context in which we drive up attainment. And particularly, we will significantly reduce the inequity in educational outcomes from children from deprived backgrounds. Resource spending will fall slightly between 2014 and 16, but we'll see continued investment to implement the Curriculum for Excellence and the new national qualifications. And we're continuing to invest in our schools' estate through the £1.25 billion Scotland Schools for the Future programme. The committee, of course, has been interested in our ambitious post-16 reforms. I've welcomed the focus you've had on colleges in particular. Uh, throughout this budget, I'm pleased on the emphasis we've put on colleges, be able to increase the funding floor from £522 million in 2014-15 to £526 million in 2015-16. That allows us to maintain our commitments on student numbers and support the implementation of some of Sir Ian Wood's recommendations. This afternoon's debate will provide a very welcome opportunity to discuss Sir Ian's interim findings. And whilst we will, of course, have still to receive the final report, it's clear that colleges and schools will be involved in our efforts to improve job prospects for Scotland's young people. Regionalisation is transforming the sector, and it's important to emphasise how much Wood rests his argument, both on the success of CFE and the success of regionalisation. Uh, but our focus isn't on institutions themselves, but on helping young people at every stage into jobs and meeting the needs of employers. We're supporting NPD investment and exciting college developments. And we're also ensuring that our universities remain internationally competitive and as we invest to ensure that no funding gap opens up with universities elsewhere in these islands. We've allocated an additional £19.3 million of resource funding to our HE sector in 14-15. That will ensure that we maintain our commitment to free higher education to all Scots dem domiciles and, of course, a substantial proportion, up to 20%, or perhaps more, of our higher education is delivered in colleges. And for as long as this government is in power, education in Scotland will always, always be based on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. And our student support package is the best in these islands, provides students with an annual support package of up to £7,250 a year. Finally, convener, as you focus on youth unemployment, then that is obvious too, that is one of our uh, key focuses. Last year, youth employment in Scotland was below the UK rate and down 0.3% on the previous year. Our investment in training opportunities for young people is working. That's why with this budget, we've extended the funding for 25,000 modern apprenticeships per year into 15-16. We continue to fund the opportunities for all to guarantee every young person a place in education or training, will continue to deliver the Employability Fund, providing better support for those participating in pre-employment training. 
along with other budgets in Scotland, ours continues to bear the mark, of, alas, of UK government cuts. But we've identified savings where we can and produced a programme that will continue to protect and enhance education in Scotland. I believe convenient Scottish education continues to improve. There's always room for improvement. In this referendum year, we're investing to make it better still. We're investing in early years, in our curriculum, in our colleges, in employment, in our universities. And I welcome questions in the committee on how we intend to do so. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to move straight to questions, uh, beginning with George Adam. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Uh, increasing youth employment uh, through a range of training and learning opportunities central to the Scottish Government's strategy. You know, with the current uh, challenges and the landscape that we have outside uh, in the real world there, you know, with the limited number of employers available to recruit young people, can youth employability initiatives realistically lead, lead to large numbers of young people achieving sustainable employment, Cabinet Secretary? I believe they can, but what we require to do is to uh, proselytise for those initiatives everywhere we can and encourage employers of every size to take them up. Uh, as, uh, as Joan McAlpine knows, I was in Dumfries yesterday afternoon and uh, late yesterday afternoon, early yesterday evening, I spoke to a group of employers of varying sizes uh, in uh, Dumfries Academy. And I emphasise the need for every employer to consider what they could do and to play a part. Now, of course, the second part of the wood uh, uh, process is to look at employers, to look at employment and to look at the wider uh, scene and to see how business and industry can be further engaged. And, you know, I pay tribute to the fantastic work that my colleague Angela Constance is doing, this uh, Europe's first uh, and only, I think, so far Minister for Youth Employment, that is constantly encouraging a, a range of initiatives. Some MSPs have held individual jobs fairs, I have myself and seeing the effect there, where you can draw people into, and employers into, a dialogue which produces results. So we should be unstinting in our efforts to try and continue with this, and I think those uh, are working, those initiatives are working and continue to work. Some of the discussions we've had with regards to youth employment has been about communication and that very idea of making sure businesses, colleges and all that work together. I know it was the intention of the post-16 reform to help make that a wee bit more easier for everyone to work within that context. Is there any current proof that things are moving in that direction, Cabinet Secretary? Well, I, I see a positivity that's surrounding it now. It's important that we have that positivity. We've been through you know, a difficult process with the post-16 bill and, and there have been different views about it. But I think now is the time to make sure that the, uh, the whole of the Parliament gets behind the college sector, gets behind the employment initiatives and makes sure they work. And, and that requires going out and talking positively about what can be done because a great deal can be done. Um, I think there are signs that this is working. I think you see signs in the figures themselves where you know, there's been a constant uh, attempt to ensure that young people get the opportunities. I think opportunities for all is a very positive thing as well. You know, I don't believe in coercion. I don't believe in systems that force people to do things and disadvantage them if they don't do them. But I think the power of persuasion in this system has been such that we're seeing a very positive uptick and we will continue to do so. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Liz Smith. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, by what criteria uh, is the Scottish Government uh, measuring uh, which of the initiatives are most successful when it comes to solving uh, youth unemployment? Well, I think there are a number of criteria. One is uptake, you know, and it's uptake both by individual young people and by employers. And although that's a slightly, I suppose you could say, a slightly subjective um, uh, criteria, it is important. If some initiatives do not attract support, either from young people or from employers, uh, then you've got a problem. Uh, and you do that over a period of time. By that measure, uh, 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 Modern Apprenticeships is outstandingly successful because we, we meet our target year on year and there are young people going there and, of course, those are employed young people. So that's one. There's the broad criteria, which is to look at youth employment figures and to say, is that working? Uh, I think one of the difficulties, and you and I have discussed this before at this committee, one of the difficulties is getting the data that then dr drills down to the next stage of that. And that's why the post-16 bill in that piece which not many people paid much attention to uh, on the data exchange and sharing activity was important. And I think we're going to see the benefit of that. Um, so is things like the um, a senior phase benchmarking tool. Uh, that sounds a, a very technical thing, but you'll know what that is and how we're rolling it out. The 
it first iteration of that, the sample iteration, was re released at the Learning Festival. And as a result of, of Woods, Ian Wood's recommendations, we've taken very much on board that the senior phase benchmarking tool should include information on vocational qualifications. And I think will extend outwards over a period of time to give us some very, very detailed information on how these systems work. When we had the um, debate last year about uh, uh, waiting lists, uh, you know, there was an attempt to use so-called waiting lists as, a, as an indication of whether or not demand existed and whether or not people were being served. I think we've, I hope we've gone past that rather crude measure because there are no such things, and college principals will tell you there are no such things as those type of waiting lists, but we can get more information from outcomes of college courses. I was at Cardonnell College yesterday before I went down to Dumfries, um, and one of the, the courses I visited was the Digital Media Skills course. Mm -hmm. Now, the uptake that they get for their people who leave at various stages of those courses, whether it is a foundation course, whether it's a, a, an ONC, whether it's an HND, how, whatever those courses are, is a very good indication of what works and also what the state of the market is and how that, that college can push the market. I also saw some of the student nurses. Again, we need to know more about the various levels. Some come in from school, some come in from, from a variety of youth initiatives, some come in later in life, and we need to know more about how they come out. So essentially, there are a wide range of ways in which we can measure those outcomes. And I'm always looking for more, and I encourage the Funding Council to look for, provided we don't get into information overload. Could I just ask you on the point you mentioned about uh, how you see the improvements because of the outcome agreements? Um, is it your expectation that uh, this uh, academic year, the colleges uh, will, and they, obviously the new colleges in terms of the uh, regionalisation process, that they will meet their recruitment targets? Forget about the waiting list argument, but is it your expectation that they will meet? I would hope targets? so. I would very much hope so, and the universities as well. I mean, you know, it, it is important. One of the most important things that a college and a university can do is to say accurately, this is what we think the demand is, this is what we need to meet that demand, please make sure we have the resource to meet that demand. And I think that's the outcome agreement process. So yes, my expectation is, and I think if colleges were not meeting their targets, I would want to know about that quite early on. But the, the, the outcome agreement process is a rolling process. I mean, you know, I think it's moved on very substantially from the early discussions. And both in the college and the university sector, there is a rolling process by which both sides know what is being done and how it is being done. And I'd expect that to be picked up quite quickly. Okay. Um, do you have any concerns at all that, in the context of the budget that because you're placing emphasis on 16 to 19, uh, that there will be other areas, part-time students, adult learners, um, we've got some pretty worrying statistics in each of these at the moment, uh, that as a result of the focus that you've got in 16 to 19 on youth employment, that there are other areas of college uh, students who are suffering? Uh, no, but I am always conscious of the fact that the role of colleges and the reach of colleges is much wider than 16 to 19 year olds. And, you know, there was and continues to be, I think, an imperative to tackle the issue of both actual and, and potential youth unemployment. You know, I, I don't want to rehearse the argument forever, but you know, those of us who lived through any period of time where there was uh, a considerable period of youth unemployment and saw the effects of that and the long-term effects that still exist in some communities mm -hmm. in Scotland, mm -hmm. you know, were quite determined um, as the, the impending financial crisis unfolded that we would focus resource on that. I think it is possible for colleges to have a wider and broader view, and they do, in two areas in particular uh, where I think I have accepted concern that there might be problems, we have acted. On the issue of women returners, we've put an additional £10 million into that and encouraged the colleges to uh, spend that money and to, and to work hard on spending that money. And as you know, uh, uh, and mem one or two members here have been at the cross-party group on learning disability, uh, I have encouraged the charities in that area to work with the colleges and with the funding council to find imaginative and ambitious ways to ensure that the reach of colleges to those with learning disabilities is maintained and enhanced. Uh, I am always um, open to discussion if there are people who appear to be disadvantaged, but I do think that the figures the full-time equivalent figures bear out very strongly 
the depth and breadth of college activity. Yeah, Cameron, I, do, I don't deny that, but the basis for your, uh, your budget uh, scrutiny, also the um, aims and ambitions that the Scottish Government has put for the actual Scottish economy, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got statistics here that say for the 25 to 59 age group, um, in 2008-9, the figure was 161, that's gone down to 106,000. Um, and also when it comes to part-time learners, uh, same year it was uh, 398,000 down to 280-odd thousand. You know, these are quite significant drops. Well, I think that you have to put that in context, and there's a number of contexts that you need to put it in. And I say that you know, quite genuinely. The first context is we have focused much more on full-time equivalent places, and I, th I do really believe that's the best and safest measure, because all other measures do not compare like with like. There's a huge range of things that colleges may not do anymore for a variety of reasons. You know, the, the, the difference in regulation on the individual learning accounts, for example, has reduced the ability of some people who might otherwise want to take college courses, whether they be you know, uh, retired people or whatever, from taking short-term college courses. I'm not saying there's anything wrong in them doing so. I'm just saying that that has had to take second place to the issues of youth unemployment. And I think that everybody in society would accept that that is an important thing to do. Second one is the pattern of learning has changed. Many people learn in different ways and are continuing to live in, learn in different ways online, a vast range of different ways to learn that there were even five years ago, and that continues to be the case. Nobody is denying there has been a change in the way in which colleges operate. The way in which colleges operate is now focused very substantially on issues of employment, and for a period of time, particularly on youth employment. Uh, but I, uh, when I see evidence that there are people who need additional help in this regard, we will try to give that help. Uh, John Henderson said to us uh, last week that he was a bit concerned about uh, this kind of statistic. He was saying that it, you know, it put at risk the uh, idea of lo lifelong learning. Do you think he's right? No, I, I don't. I mean, I, I work very closely, for example, with the regional leads and the principals. Uh, none of them are making that point to me. All of them are conscious of the need constantly to be aware of the breadth that is required in their offer and want to have that breadth. In terms of, of adult learning and lifelong learning, I, I chaired last uh, Wednesday morning, last Thursday morning, the first ever strategic forum for adult learning. And I am very keen that we engage closely uh, with adult learning organisations and others, and there's a strong link into the college sector. We established, as you know, as a result of the von Pronzinski Review, the Strategic Forum for Higher Education. We established, as a result of the Griggs Review, the Strategic Forum for, for Further Education. I was very keen that we put one in place for adult and, and lifelong learning, which has never been done before. We've brought to the table the main organisations that continue to expand that, and there's an interface with colleges so that we do focus on the issues of adult le and lifelong learning. And the purpose of that forum, the first purpose, is to develop both a statement of ambition for that and, a st uh, and an indication of how that can be delivered. So I think what we're trying to do, you know, at times of difficulty, is continue to emphasize and indeed re-emphasize the importance of lifelong learning, which I believe very strongly. It's in my, it's in my job title. You know, and, and actually there are very few ministers who have it in their job title across, across Europe. I want to make sure that we continue to do that. Uh, we will try and continue to do it. Thank you. Uh, Neil Bobby. Thanks, Convener. Um, you mentioned, uh, earlier, Cabinet Secretary, about the uptake of specific schemes. And I just wanted to ask you about the Youth Employment Scotland uh, Fund, uh, which I understand aimed to get 10,000 jobs for 16 to 24-year-olds. It's a £25 million fund set up in April 2000. And 13. I understand that there's um, uptake on that has has been low, and there's a significant underspend on that, or, or there certainly was. Can, can you inform us what the the underspend and uptake has been of that that fund? Yes, of course. Um, I think page 31. Let me just get the details. Well, of course, this was funded by um, the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. Was a, a one-off opportunity to boost youth, youth employment. Um, and of the jobs that were predicted, about 5,000 uh, plus of those are, going, are starting in 13, 14. So they will be met. And the wider eligibility criteria will increase the number of places funded this year. 
Um, I think it's going to produce the, the number of jobs that we anticipated, um, there or thereabouts, and uh, it is continuing to go ahead. This was a one-off, of course. Um, if further uh, European Union money was available, then I think it's the type of thing that we do again. And there were some issues of criteria that mm -hmm. had to be sorted out. I don't know if Dr Scott wants to, to say anything more about it. No, I mean the scheme. The, the, the scheme has started. It will continue until um, it will continue until April. We'll take a view um, uh, um, in due course about whether it should continue. Um, uh, we are examining whether the eligibility criteria should um, be widened to include um, larger employers, and is presently the case. And I think this led to the success of the scheme in due course. Um, since the scheme was um, considered, of course, the youth labour market has improved quite considerably. Unemployment is down, and employment is up. So that would come into the mix too. OK, uh, thank you very much. Can I move on to uh, Joan McAlpine? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I wanted to continue the theme of youth employment uh, by asking whether you could update us on the Opportunities for All initiative, the commitment of the Scottish Government to offer a place in learning or training to every 16 to 19 year old who, who's not in education, employment or training already. It's now two years since uh, the Opportunities for All was announced. Um, are you happy with the way it's being implemented? I am. I think it was... Uh the first year, there was uh, probably colleges themselves were a little uncertain about how it might work out for them. But it is a guarantee that we make, and it's a guarantee that's been honoured. Um, it's not a compulsion, and I think it's quite important to talk about that. There's been a, there's a lot of discussion and debate about issues of compulsion and whether people should be forced to do things. I would much rather encourage people to, to do things. And I think the offer, because it's not a compulsion, has been particularly useful because people have said, here's some opportunities, why don't you take them? It's encouraged people to take them. So I'm, I mean, I'm encouraged by how it's gone. It will continue to be in place. Um, and I think it is an important part of the mix. Of course, Euro in European terms, there's a strong desire and demand, which has been resisted by the UK government, to extend that type of guarantee to 24, 25 year olds. And I think that's something that Angela Constance has said she would be very keen to see happen. Uh, that we should make sure that there is a, a good, strong offer uh, as long as possible. And uh, let's see if what, what we can do with that. Right. Um, could you give us any more details on timescales for extending the offer? Well, um, if the people of Scotland were to choose independence, I would see it as a key issue. And uh, let's, let's campaign on the issue that that's the type of vision we have for Scotland, the Scotland where uh, the prospect of offering opportunity to young people is as strong as it possibly can be. Yeah. You made the point that you haven't gone down the road of compulsion, but do you have targets for the Opportunities for All programme? Oh, my target is 100%. I mean, it has to be. I want everybody to take it up. But, you know, it, 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 that will not happen because some young people won't do that. I think the question in here is, you know, should you say to young people, you know, either you do this or... I just don't think that's the type of society which works in the end of the day. I want to encourage young people to do things. I want to find ways of, of giving them a, a real excitement at the prospects that lie ahead of them. And that's what we're strongly endeavouring to do, and that's what we'll go on doing. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, follow that up? What, what does su success look like? If, I mean, we all want 100%, but if we can't achieve 100%, what, what is successful in your view, Cabinet Secretary? Well, I think if you would tie it, say, you know, 100% is real success, 80% is not success, you get into a bit of a trouble. I want to say, I want every young person at school to say what to do, you know, what do I want to do? How can I be excited about the prospects in front of me? What, you know, here, to quote a school motto I'm familiar with, here lies a field open to the talents. Everybody has uh, some skill, some ability to, to do something, and we need to help them to find that and to move forward. Now, Wood gives us another opportunity. I don't want to rehearse this afternoon's discussion and debate too much, but Wood gives us another opportunity. Because within the context of Curriculum for Excellence, where you have a broad general education that then moves into, into a, a more specialised senior phase, you've got a real foundation and ground there in which you can build. And if we can get wood, the wood implementation right, then it will mean the richness of choice. It's not an either or. It's not even in this phrase, which I know is much used, parity of esteem. It is actually saying that education, com a complete education, provides opportunities right across the board in vocational and academic subjects, gives people the chance to choose and encourages people to do so. And I think that we need that type of society. Now, it's wider than education, because you know, education doesn't solve all problems. You need to bring to bear 
uh, welfare, uh, tax benefits, labour market regulation to close the equity gap. If, you, if we can close the equity gap in Scottish education, then more people will be inspired and excited in that way. But I think that success looks like that type of system operating well for all young people. There will always be young people who do not wish to take part in anything, and that is where we are. But I'd like to see that. I'd like to see as much work as possible from inspiring teachers and others to make it work. We had some discussion last week about uh, the ability um, of the government and public sector bodies to follow up uh, young people. In effect, are we, are we sure that uh, those who are taking up these opportunities in the first place are actually moving on to... We call it, often call it positive destinations, but sustainable employment in the longer term. Well, I think we see from SDS's statistics that the outcomes are pretty good. You know, and, and the latest, I think, SDS statistics yeah. earlier this year showed that those outcomes were good and were getting better. Um, we also instituted the data sharing arrangements through the post-16 bill precisely for those reasons, convener, as you know, mm -hmm. because we felt that the information that was being exchanged and the information that could follow young people wasn't good enough. I go back to the senior phase benchmarking tool. That's another part of it. All that stuff, which is not an increase in data burden, but is actually asking the right questions and putting them into the system in the right way, will help us to do so. Yeah. But will that work and other work that's going on effectively... Um Will it, will it effectively make sure that somebody, whoever it happens to be, is targeted with the responsibility, is given the responsibility to look after or ask questions of those who drop out or who yes. refuse, who effectively it should, are out? Of it, sh it should. Pro that should exist, it, both either in SDS uh, or it can exist more widely in the community. It can exist in training providers. It can exist in schools. But yes, it is the answer. Now, will it happen on every occasion? It will probably take some time to happen on every occasion. But I think it should happen, yes. Thank you very much. It's a small country. The numbers we're talking about are not enormous numbers. Thank you. Jane Baxter. Thanks. Um, good morning. Um, Liz Smith asked some questions earlier about um, adult learners and the role of colleges in, in encouraging and supporting adult learners. Um, and, and I was wondering um, about the whether the Scottish Government's completed a full equality impact assessment on the, the sort of move to prioritising youth initiatives. Has that ever been done to, to assess the impact on women, mm -hmm. um, people with disabilities and people with additional support needs? I think John Swinney gave evidence in this at the, at the EET committee uh, in which he talked about the way in which we had assessed the impact of, of these changes. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'm happy to make sure that uh, that evidence is provided to you. From my perspective, where, uh, where I sit, um, the important thing in 2008, 2009, I became Cabinet Secretary for Education in December 2009, the important thing as the impact of youth unemployment began to hit us was to make sure that we put as much into the front line as quickly as possible to make sure that we did not have a tsunami of youth unemployment that lasted in the long term. I would hazard a guess, I, 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 we don't know each other very well, but I would hazard a guess that in Fife you are familiar with places and communities which are still bearing the scars of last massive youth unemployment. And you know, as I know, families who um, you know, have had generations, uh, several generations of worklessness as a, regard, uh, as a result. Uh, I was, I think I, I'm allowed to use the word passionately committed to making sure that we would do whatever we could to make sure that that didn't happen. And one of the tools we used, and there were several, the, the modern apprenticeship tool, the SDS tool, the way in which we increased the capacity of SDS to do these things, we brought SDS I I into full function. But another tool was undoubtedly focusing on youth uh, issues and, and youth training in colleges and the guarantee which we brought forward. Um, if there has been uh, any concomitant effect on other group of, of, of adult learners, then you know, we've looked at that where we believe it's taken place and tried to help, and I will continue to do so. But I think that judgment was the right judgment at the right time to do the right things. Now, you know, Mr. Swinney has addressed some of the wider uh, issues, and we'll let you have that evidence. Mm -hmm. When you say um, that the government will take steps to help, what sorts of steps could the government take to, to mitigate those impacts? Well, I've indicated some of them. I mean, for example, on the women returners, I was very keen to provide additional resource focused entirely on that. Um, interesting, you know, issues arise in bursaries where we've had any evidence that there's been pressure on bursaries from groups, uh, for example, uh, for, for uh, childcare or whatever. We've, the SFC has stepped in to try and help with those matters. 
On the learning disabilities issue, I've met with the charities, I think, on two separate occasions. I've attended the cross-party group. We've provided additional resources. We've sought projects from them uh, to say, how could we spend money to, to help with that matter? And so we'll continue. And when I mentioned the Adult Learning Strategic Forum, mm -hmm. it is a very strong, it arose out of an event at New Battle last um, uh, March, uh, which I attended. And then I attended a subsequent follow-up. And it seemed to me that one of the things we could bring to bear to, to make sure that lifelong learning and adult learning was given the focus and priority, which it had not had over a period of time, was to bring that uh, into some sort of parity in terms of our strategic approach and how the government supported it. You know, I, I chair the, the, the forum for, for, for uh, higher education and further education. I'm going to chair the adult forum too. So you know, uh, the cabinet secretary will focus on making sure that each part of that uh, continuum has strong attention and we can build the right strategy for it. So, and I'm all op also open, I have to say to you, to other ideas. If there are things that you see mm -hmm. happening in, in Fife in what is an emerging college situation, I think mm -hmm. could be a very strong one, <laughs> one that in parts of Fife, Fife has not been without its problems, which have not been to do with resource, but other problems. In all those circumstances, if you have those issues, please come and talk to me about them, and I'm more than willing to discuss them. Okay, thanks. Thanks, convener. Uh, Neil Bibby. You mentioned that you would send us a, um, what John Swinney said about the equalities impact assessment. Uh, I've, could you also send us any equalities impact assessments the Education Department have done? I will make sure that you receive documentation on this, but I've made the point to, to your colleague, and I will make it again here. The decision to take forward the issue of prioritising young people and prioritising youth training was based upon a you know, very strong experience and feeling of what had happened um, previous generations, and I would have hoped that would have had a wide support across the Parliament. Okay. Um, should we again? Mm. All right, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, just, um, just, just in terms of, um, you mentioned earlier, Cabinet Secretary, you, you've increased the, the funding floor for colleges, but, but could you confirm um, that there will actually be a real terms cut to the college budget in 2014-15 and 2015-16? No, Mr. Bibby, you wouldn't expect me to confirm that, and I'm not going to confirm that because the figures are in front of you, and you can see exactly what the situation is. Um, you know, we have uh, made substantive changes to the college uh, sector. Uh, we, I promised last year that I would create a funding floor of five to two. I have done so. Um, that will continue in 14-15, and there will be a small, but I think significant decrease in 15-16. Uh, that is substantially better than the expectation that existed, I think, at this time last year. Um, and uh, given the ONS reclassification, the figures clearly indicate that the overall college operational expenditure is £687 million, which is in the figures uh, in front of you, uh, and the operational income, which is non-governmental income, is £165 million, and that uh, means that the, the net is 521.7. Uh, it also, the figures also now that the ONS uh, uh, classification uh, is required to be used show that the college capital expenditure is 46 million, 46.1 million. The expenditure receipts on capital is 19.5 million. So the net college capital is 26.6 million. The those give you a more complete set of figures than we have uh, ever given before on college funding. Uh, you may, of course, draw your own conclusions from them. Um. In terms of in terms of the the real terms 2013 prices, can you confirm that the the baseline 2013-14 was 521.7 million, and at 2013 prices it will be 512 million in 2014-15, and then 506.8 million in 2015-16. If you wish to put those figures on the record, of course you are able to do so. I have indicated to you what is taking place, and what is taking place is a substantial improvement on earlier plans. It indicates precisely what we believe needs to happen in a sector which required reform, and that reform has taken place. And regionalisation is producing its benefits. And indeed, I think Ian Wood makes that point in his report. Um, well, can you can you also confirm? You, you said it's uh, massively improved on previous plans. Can you also confirm that in 2012-13? Um, the total figure for college funding was 546.4 million. And in the 2014-15, even in uh, cash terms, will be um, 521.7 million. So we've seen a, a 25 million pounds cut in, in, in two years. 
As I say, if you wish to read out the figures that you have in front of you, you're absolutely at liberty to do so. Uh, my position is that the published plans for colleges have been in the public domain for a very considerable period of time. They are the result of a series of changes and mergers which will produce significant savings for the colleges. Um, and indeed, the, the, the report on that from uh, the um, Gantz Commission and the report of that from the SFC is absolutely clear. I, I suppose one figure I might add into the mix, just so that we add into the mix if we're all putting things on the record, is that the figure for uh, 12, 13, 14 and 14, 15 uh, will remain higher than the figure of the last year of our predecessor administration. So therefore, we are spending more than our predecessor administration did. I put that in fact on the record too. And you're spending nearly £100 million less in new terms compared to the... I put on the record my figure. figures and I stand by them and I think, you know, I regret that the important process of change in colleges, which is warmly commented on by many commentators, including Sir Ian Wood's report, uh, was opposed by the Labour Party, who also voted against widening access and also voted against, regrettably, a single set of terms and conditions for staff. But I just put that back on the record. In terms of, in terms of um, uh, quality issues, we've, we've received concerns from, from uh, Unison and others about the reductions in, in staffing at our colleges. According to Colleges Scotland, we've seen a reduction in staff from 16,900 in 2009 to 13,600 in 2013. That's a drop of 3,200 in that period of time, nearly one in five staff. Um, if the regionalisation agenda is to save around 50 million pounds. How many more job losses will we see over the coming years? Well, uh, colleges are the employers, not the Scottish Government. So colleges make the decision on how they deliver uh, their courses. You know, the right way to decide on what is delivered in colleges, and I'm sure Mr Bibby will agree on me in this, is not to take an arbitrary figure for staff, nor to take an arbitrary figure for budget, but to focus on the individual needs of individual learners, then to decide what the appropriate curriculum is to fulfil those needs, then to decide the appropriate place in which those things are delivered and to come to that conclusion. Uh, it is to, absolutely meaningless to do it any other way. What we are seeing is a college sector that has been strengthened by the process of regionalisation to focus on its core mission, and I'm glad that that fact is being welcomed right across the sector. I was, I was, I was simply uh, stating, Mr Russell, that we've seen a 3,200 reduction in staff over the past... A couple of years, and I was asking for an indication of how many more job losses we're likely to see. I, I, I think you would have to ask each individual college what their plans are. When I visit those colleges, I see colleges of scale and ambition, which are delivering very significant courses to very large number of people of every age. And the staff are fully focused on that activity, and indeed very supportive of the change that has taken place. Nobody was denying that reform was a difficult process. It was a difficult process. But reform was necessary to ensure that we had the college sector that was fit for the 21st century, and that's what we have done. And I think that that is a very widespread view that that was the right thing to do. Um, on the issue of, of full-time courses and, and quality, you've said that um, priority has to be on full-time courses. Can I ask you therefore why you've reduced the number of hours that a full-time course can consist of from 720 hours to 640 hours a year? Well, I didn't reduce the number of hours. The Funding Council reduced the number of hours, and there's always a debate about how courses are delivered are to do that? And, in, and, and in what sort of way they are delivered. You know, I mean, I, I, I think it's quite important that we talk to and listen to the professionals in these fields and the way they deliver courses. And if they believe they can deliver courses more effectively and more efficiently for public money, you know, my role as a, as a minister is to say that's a good thing so that we can get more bangs for our buck. You know, that's the reality of what we're trying to do at difficult times financially. And I pay tribute to the work of every single college lecturer and every single college manager who's managed to do that and has continued to increase the quality of college learning. You know, yesterday at Cardonald, I not only saw the, uh, the digital uh, uh, media students. I spent a little time in, in a department that does fashion and, uh, and uh, design, and I saw absolutely world-beating work that's going on with a number of local employers in Scotland. You know, those of us who are old enough to remember the demise of the lace industry up in the valley in, in Ayrshire, you know, there's still one or two people, I think one company producing, they're working with Cardonald on stunning designs and ways of producing new material that's being sold all over the world. 
This is, and those students are going from basic one-year courses right through to articulation through to Harriet Watt to do degree courses, and they are going into good, solid jobs that are producing things in Scotland. There's the reality of the college sector. And, you know, my job is to present that reality, to encourage that to take place, and to make sure that it continues to take place. Uh, arbitrary discussions uh, the, of the type you want to have, you're entitled to have, but, you know, what you need to do, I think, what the Parliament needs to do is to get behind the college sector and make it work, because it is working. And you do it a disservice if it's run down in the way it's being run down by your questions. I, obviously, I asked you about the, the, the number of hours being reduced for full-time course, full courses from 7.26.40. You said that was an FS. Scottish Funding Council decision, not your decision. Did you support that decision? Presumably you did. Well, what I do is I let the Scottish Funding Council do their job so that we can have a really effective sector in Scotland. You know, I would be very keen if you engaged in that process and you engaged in encouraging the excellence of the Scottish college sector. That's what it's about. You know, it's about making sure that we do not have mass youth unemployment. It's about making sure that we're contributing to the future prosperity of Scotland and individuals in Scotland. That's the reality. Now, you know, we've had a long debate about the bill. We had that debate last year. The bill was passed. The bill is now law. Regionalisation is in place. <laughs> Regionalisation has produced and is producing colleges of scale, and the excellence of what takes place in those colleges is undoubted. I think that is where our focus should be. And I think until, I mean, I was very glad to see you uh, and uh, Kezia Dugdale present last uh, Tuesday at the first birthday party of uh, Edinburgh College. I thought that was an encouraging sign that you were celebrating the success of the college in Edinburgh, which had gone through a difficult process of merger and was succeeding in things. I think that that type of work with the colleges will produce dividends. I endorse your presence there. I'm glad to have seen you there. Liam McArthur. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Governing Secretary. Um, just following up on, uh, on the point uh, you Nobody know, was making in relation to, to quality. I mean, clearly the colleges have said whatever budget they have, they will make um, it go as far as they possibly can. But the other point they were making was that as well as um, the constraint on the budget, they were seeing uh, additional responsibilities uh, placed upon them. And what we've seen through this evidence session, um, as we saw last, uh, last year as well, was that the reductions in staffing that um, Mr Bibby's referred to alongside the rising weighted uh, sums targets is creating pressure and some anxieties about the quality of the provision uh, that's being provided. And I, I think if I uh, would assume that from um, the government's policies up until now in terms of um, primary school education, the issue of ratios is seen as directly relevant to the quality of the provision. Does that not hold to the same extent in, in college provision? Are you prepared to accept that expanding those, those ratios needn't necessarily have a bearing on the quality uh, of what's provided? I have argued, it's an interesting point, I have argued, of course, that the biggest effect of smaller class sizes lies in primaries one to three. So I suppose the logical extension of my own argument would be that the diminishing effect depends how, older, how much older you are. Uh, and in those circumstances, I don't think it has the same effect in, in colleges. But, you know, uh, Mr. McCarthy, I'm not unsympathetic to evidence-led um, argument on this. You know, if the, if the inspection process of colleges is indicating problems there, then by all means that should be looked at. I don't see that evidence. I see evidence of colleges that are, uh, have gone through a process of change and merger and are now delivering higher than ever quality uh, courses to a, a very focused range of students. But, you know, I'm always open to discussion on, on issues that arise. And if individual colleges, you know, say at any stage there is a difficulty here, then that's something the Funding Council, first of all, the college management should address within the resources and the Funding Council should address. So I'm by no means unsympathetic to that. But I do think that what, having gone through the process of merger and change, having got the regional colleges operating, having heard very positive things about that process, we should continue to build and support that. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Cabinet Secretary, um, the SCDI uh, in summer 2013 carried out a survey of employers as regards the, their skill requirements. And the results showed that 59% of employers surveyed found some of their vacancies hard to fill for a number of reasons, but some of them uh, clearly in relation to the skills that the applicants held. 
What steps are the Scottish Government taking to ensure that the workforce has the skills needed to meet the current and future labour requirements? There's the closest of liaison between employers, um, employers associations, uh, SDS, uh, the government, um, and Angela in particular through her work, to ensure that, addition, that issue is constantly addressed. Um, and it's a matter that colleges have an important role in too. Colleges are, are close to the labour market. And indeed, one of the ideas of, of reorganisation and creating colleges of scale is that on a regional level, they can be even closer to the labour market. And, and their sensitivity is pretty great to what is taking place. And their doors are open to employers who will come forward and say, look, there are these areas that we feel are skill shortages. Some areas are, are glaringly obvious. You know, when you go to the northeast of Scotland, quite quite clearly, there are issues within engineering and within the oil industry that require um, uh, uh, you know training to take place, and there is a big focus on it. I was at Banff and Buchan College this year um, in the summer during the Fraserburgh Cabinet, and they're very focused on making sure that the specific needs are being met. Um, other colleges that I've been in recently have 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 a same the same focus. So. I wouldn't point to one thing. I'd point to uh, essentially the context in which we all work to be sensitive to that. And the SCDI plays a role in that too. Uh, you know, Scottish Engineering plays a role in that. All organisations point to where issues are and are able to train. There's a, there's a pipeline issue behind it, though, that's even, I think, more significant. It's not just specific training for work. It is also readiness for work, and you will hear employers talk about that. Uh, regular. I was addressing it in, in the feast last night. So the new certificate of work readiness, for example, that is, is now uh, available, it helps to address that. So I think we're in a, a constant state of consideration of how that works and how it should work. So there's been some evidence given, and I think Unison was one of them, one of the organisations that uh, highlighted this, that there was insufficient interreaction between the colleges and the smaller employers who perhaps didn't have the same resources mm -hmm. to be able to engage with the colleges as the big, the bigger uh, employers. I, we encourage colleges to address that issue regularly, and I'm sure they do. We have an, a persistent issue in Scotland in terms of small and medium-sized enterprises engaging them, for example, in research activity. You know, one of the issues on the Horizon 2020 um, uh, planning has been to say, how do we get small and medium-sized enterprises into, into research and development activity in Scotland? Um, and you know the funding council addresses this through the interface and other programs. So yes, we need to constantly do so. And some small and medium-sized enterprises, by definition, aren't group players. You know they won't be members of organisations. It is difficult to do. Constant visibility and presence is important for colleges uh, and inviting people in. And so is so is leading by example. If you can get one small employer in a, in a small town to take on board one modern apprentice, and it works out well. The word of mouth thing is fantastic, and it really works. I mean, also, if you can get one MSP to organise a jobs fair in a smallish community, I mean, we had a very successful one in Dunoon uh, during the summer, uh, and get both small and large employers interested in seeing what's there, you can begin to create an atmosphere that says this is important to us. Just a final question. What, what steps have been taken in relation to working age adults, 25 and over, to, uh, for them to gain access to reskilling or upskilling in order to cope with the changing labour market? Colleges are effective uh, attractors of, of older students who are often motivated to change. Uh, and when you visit college courses, you will find uh, quite a number of, of older students who are retraining in one way or the other. At, uh, at um, Falkirk earlier this year, uh, on the, the, the test rig, uh, and it's a rig that, they, that, that simulates uh, conditions um, offshore in, 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 in engineering. I met a very interesting youngish lady, I would say, she would be in her late 20s, who had previously been a travel agent. And uh, she had decided that being a travel agent wasn't particularly fun sitting behind a desk talking to people, uh, but she decided she wanted to retrain as a process engineer. And she was out there on the test rig and she was planning to go offshore. People get motivated, they need to have access to colleges, and colleges of scale can do that and are doing that. Uh, so are SDS doing. Thank you. Thank you. Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the European Next General Relations Committee took out evidence from the Latvian ambassador, um, who uh, Latvia have just taken over the presidency of the, the European Union for the next six months. Lithuania. Lithuania, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, 
When we were asking about the priorities for the next six months, obviously youth employability and job creation were, were key given the problems across Europe. So given that you've already explained the, the, the use of the, 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 the one-off funding for, for tracking youth employability, could you give us some indication as to what progress has been made mm -hmm. in terms of what structural funds might be accessed in the coming year? Well, the progress of, of, of the, the new structural funds Availability of structural funds grinds on, I think is the word to use. But Angela Constance is very active on the European sphere, both in Brussels and more widely with other ministers who have an engagement in this issue, and also in, in, amongst the ministers in these islands, and she continues to take that forward. I mean, we anticipate resource being made available, uh, and when it is made available, we will apply it uh, in the best way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liam McArthur. Thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you opened um, the session today with a, a, a wide sweep over um, all the areas that fall under your purview within the context of the budget. So in that spirit, um, can I perhaps um, ask you about funding in relation to higher education and particularly uh, the, uh, the grants available? And I wonder whether you might either now or, or in due course write to the committee with um, an estimate how much will be spent on non-refundable uh, or non-repayable, sorry, student support in each year from 2012 uh, to uh, 2013 uh, onwards for as, uh, as far as figures currently mm -hmm. exist. Happy yeah. to do so. Good. I, I mean, I asked this to some extent on the back of um, uh, an article uh, published uh, at the end of last week um, where one of the former um, officials in, the, uh, in, in your department, uh, Lucy Hunter, stated that on the basis of the figures um, that uh, are available at the moment, by 2015, 16 students from lower income backgrounds will need to borrow well over £20 million pounds more every year because the Scottish Government has replaced this lost grant with student loan. This additional borrowing will confer no extra spending power and is additional to the extra loan being used to achieve a minimum income for students. And she goes on to say it's safe to say uh, that these spending plans must be underpinned by a significant raid on the future earnings of students from low income homes, pretty much the same group who elsewhere are the target of widening access policies. I mean, even at this stage, are you able to say what the, the pattern of spend is uh, from 2012-13 onwards? Well, I think when um, a commentator uses the phrase, it's safe to say, I always wonder uh, where she might be coming from. It is not safe to say that. Uh, I did find um, her uh, article to be very curious. Let me tell you why. I'm happy to provide figures to you. First of all, you know, we are looking at the continuous improvement of uh, student support packages, and we'll do so, uh, and we'll talk about this. The cost of the disabled students' allowance, which she specifically referred to, and she actually said that uh, uh, she thought that uh, the options for dealing with what she called a continuing squeeze on student funding in higher education, which actually doesn't exist, but her options for dealing with it were an end to the practice of increasing grants by at least inflation, reducing other grants such as the Disabled Students Association allowance, or a planned reduction of student numbers. If you'll forgive me, Kameen, I just want to address all of those because her position on all of them is plain wrong, unfortunately. The cost of the Disabled Students Allowance represents less than 1% of the university's budget. Any suggestion that the answer to supposed funding pressure would be to squeeze that would be nonsensical uh, because it wouldn't make any difference at all. There is no planned reduction in student numbers. Our policy position on this has been absolutely clear. We offer free tuition precisely because we can recognise the importance of putting as many of our young people through the university system as we possibly can. So there isn't one. And indeed, far from a planned reduction, which is her phrase in the article, we actually have a record number of full-time students uh, at universities in Scotland. Uh, and the number of Scots accepted into Scottish universities has risen to a record number this year. And moreover, and you know, it was published, so I'm surprised she's been unable to access clearly published information. In order to meet our commitment to widen access, we're actually planning on funding even more places. So to use the phrase a planned reduction actually just is utterly wrong. And to base a, a, an article, an entire article, which clearly has misled some people, and I, I think probably she should apologise to those people who have misled, it, it's simply not on. It isn't happening. So therefore, the thesis is wrong. Now, in terms of the information, I'm happy to provide that information, but her article is based on an entirely false premise, and I think that needs to be said. 
grateful for that in terms of the uh, additional funding. The, the, the one other issue I wanted to um, raise with you is uh, obviously one of your your, your favoured uh, strap lines in relation to um, HE at the moment is uh, is reference to what you describe as um, a funding package for students that's the best anywhere in these aisles or in the UK. They seem to be uh, interchangeable. Um, I, I, is that still your belief? And, and would you um, be willing to provide the comparative analysis that underpins yes, that? It is my belief that, that overall that is the case. Right? I think that remains uh, the best package. There have been uh, attempts to salami slice it and to point to bits here and bits there that might need, not be as good as bits elsewhere. Overall, this is the best funding package in these islands and indeed warmly welcomed as such, I have to say, uh, by the former NUS Scotland President Robin Parker, whose quote I just have to happen to have with me. Uh, he said in August 2012, from next year, Scotland will have the best support package in the whole of the UK available to college and university students standing at higher education levels. So, not my words. I'm, I'm surprised it's not tattooed and you just carry it around on a, on a piece of paper. But, I mean, it, it, whoever's phrase it was, and I think it did emanate in, uh, originally from the Scottish Government, will you be prepared to share the I'm quite prepared to, to demonstrate to you why, overall, okay. this is the best package. I know, that, I know that there have been attempts to decry it for a variety of reasons. I think we should be very pleased that what we've tried to do in Scotland and will continue to do, and it would seem to me the sensible position is to support that uh, rather than to talk it down. Well, it was very fortunate, Cabinet Secretary, you happened to have that quote on your person. Can I move on to um, a final question which I wanted to raise with you? Um, and it's really uh, a request for an update on the position given the ONS's reclassification of the status of incorporated colleges. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, this is a change that has, is happening throughout the UK, but obviously it has uh, implications for uh, colleges and government here in Scotland. So could you perhaps lay out um, what's happening, what uh, discussions are going on, yeah. and what the next steps are? Well, you've seen today the presentation figures, which is done in a different way, and that is because of the ONS reclassification. Um, the regional leads uh, established, uh, and have a, a, a practice of operating through a, a lead person, uh, established one of the regional leads to take uh, prominence in this matter, Michael Yule, who, who chairs the, uh, uh, the, 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 the West College. Um, a considerable amount of work has been done with the Scottish Funding Council, with the government. We are in the very final stages of that. Uh, I'm confident that we have a series of arrangements which will work uh, for the colleges, and I think they are too. I think the best thing I could do as it's still being finalised is undertake to write to the committee as soon as we have that in place. And I'm happy either to come back and talk about that if it's, if it's sufficiently uh, important to you or to provide other information. But we have progressed very significantly thanks to the work of the colleges themselves thanks to the work of the SFC and thanks to the work of Scottish Government officials. Uh, well, I'd be very grateful if you could write to um, the committee with the detail of that, because obviously it's an issue it which will be a few weeks, but committee we're members. But as soon as it's available, that would mm -hmm. be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for uh, attending this morning? That concludes our evidence taking on the draft budget. Uh, can I thank all of those who have contributed both, contributed both oral and written evidence to the committee? And we will take all of that into account as we consider our draft report. And can I suspend briefly before we move on to our last item? Uh, our, last, our last item today is to consider four negative instruments. Uh, all of the instruments have the same overall policy intention. This is to transfer the property rights, liabilities and obligations to colleges as specified in each order. This is to help give effect to the college regionalisation programme, which will create 13 college regions in Scotland. Do members have any comments they wish to make on any of these instruments? No? Okay. Um, well, I'll just put a, a single question, if members agree to that, on all four instruments. Uh, just for the record, the four instruments are uh, order, uh, sorry, SSI 2013-267, 268, 269 and 270. Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on these instruments? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, that concludes our meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 29th of October, when we will consider our draft report on the budget.
I close the meeting.